you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 21st part of What If Deku Helps His Best Friend Peter Parker. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Well, Kaminari mused aloud. We're here. Momo looked about, seeing her and her teammates within the concourse of a stadium. Her group appeared to be with several others as well. From her count, in total, four of them. Hey check it out. Hagakure chimed in. I can see Takoyami. She waved, and Momo followed the general direction she seemed to be waving in and found their black cloaked peer standing amongst another group of students. He was scowling, as usual, but he noticed them and nodded in their direction. Do you see anyone else from our class? Or from class B? Momo inquired, looking over to Kaminari. He was already searching, hand above his brow. Hmm, not seeing anyone in particular. The blonde mused, looking around. Guess it'll be just you. Hi, Y-A-A-H. Kaminari yelped, turning around and seeing the source, his scream startling even Momo. Sup, fellow recommended. Takage Satsuna's mouth floated down from where it was near Kaminari's eyes and slotted back into her head, her hands on her hips in her skin-tight costume. Beside her, a stoic-looking silver-haired girl wearing a mask that covered the bottom half of her face and a lavender, fur-collared, knee-length kimono. Sweet. Two recommended students in our corner. We got this for sure. Hagakure's gloves seemed to bounce up and down. Several other students joined in around Takage. Hey, a boy with fire hoses for arms asked as he joined her. Know these people? Yeah, we go to UA. Takage smirked. Takoyami is with his group too. Kaminari gestured with his thumb behind him. So, how was your firm life? We had a firm of eight people, so for me and Yanagi, she gestured to the silver-haired girl. Momo remembered. Yanagi Ryaiko. She had that ghost-like quirk right. It was a breeze. Takage suggested, her typical grin ever so present on her visage. Was kinda tough on day two but we got it sorted out. How about you guys? I'll tell you after our exam. Momo shrugged. She looked to the side, seeing Shishikura still glaring daggers at her. The screen's on. Inagi spoke did you get the right villain? Hee <laughs> hee. Kaminari brushed his nose with his finger. You bet we did oh my tag screen. He said with surprise, looking at his tag. Momo looked at her own tag on her hip, and she looked about. Takoyami's group had their tags glow green. One group, huddled off to the side, were surprised when their tags began to glow red. Momo bit the inside of her cheek. Hum, alright then, said a voice as the screen came to life, Mira Yokimaru yawning as he smacked his lips. Now then, let's see who chose correctly, and who didn't. Mira said, look at your tags. Green if you pass, red if you fail. What the, how can we fail? Yelled one of the leaders of the group, a tall girl with clamps on her hands. Sorry youngsters, but you chose incorrectly. Please proceed to the exit of the stadium district. Your teachers are waiting. The soul group, consisting of about ten or so people, departed with their heads hung low. Ah, uh, Fukudashi is there. Yanagi muttered and Takage turned, and she frowned lightly as Momo followed her gaze. A boy with a comic panel for a head was walking out with the group. Her group, Takage's group of eight, and Takoyami. Five, thirty-one people remaining. To those who remain, congratulations on passing the preliminary portion of this provisional exam. Mira spoke from the screen on high. Hum, going by the intended groups. We have three of four. Not bad I say. He coughed into his hand a little. Now, due to the size of your current team of heroes, it is within the range of participants necessary to not enable a point adjustment. As thus, your passing exam threshold is 50 points. As long as you remain above or at 50, you pass. He then went on to explain the point deduction system, with Momo taking note and looking at Shishikura, and then at her team. Could they be docked points due to their espionage, even when it was needed to essentially pass? You there, with the red scarf? Momo turned, seeing the red scarf boy with shoulder-length black hair with his hand raised. You mentioned a point adjustment, why is that? If there is a circumstance in which the team here in question is undermanned by 30 or more percent of its ideal fighting strength, the group in question is awarded a point threshold decrease depending on the original intended manpower of the practical exam Mira explained. 
I hope that answers your questions. Now then, heroes, what is your mission? As the various murmurs broke out between the groups, Momo felt the eyes of her own team on her and stepped forward. Our mission is to stop the ghosts of Kyoto. Our intelligence has stated that they plan on destroying a government bureau in protest of recent political law amendments. She took a deep breath. We are to defeat the villains and save both the civilians and government workers on sight from them. Do you have a theory on what weapon the villains will be using at the bureau? Mira asked on the spot. Poison gas. Momo replied on the spot, remembering the research. Hmm. Mira didn't react overtly on screen. It didn't sound too bad. Reminded her of her mother whenever Momo reported on her acing a test. The sleepy proctor shrugged, looking off to the side. All right then. Best of luck heroes. Then the screen winked out. Okay everyone, ready. Momo turned around, eyeing her group and talkage. You bet we are. Kaminari gave a thumbs up. Hagakure's gloves were gripped as they bobbed up and down. The girl obviously nodding. As are we, said Takoyami. Glad to have you with us, Takoyami. Momo answered. Team Pink 3, Gold 5, and Navy Blue 7. Please make your way to the starting gate, said a loud voice within the concourse. The teen hero prospects made their way down to the gate. Su Ye Yorazu, Takage jogged up beside her. What did you have planned? Marching up to her as well was Takoyami, alongside a taller girl with dragon-like eyes and sharp fangs. Her darker skin stood out among the rest of the crowd, along with the small patches of scales along her arms and neck, and the leader of Takoyami's group, named Tsunami Rivu, hero named Kairiu. She smirked, showing a toothy grin as she was dressed in a skin-tight body armor with padding from neck to toe. But you can call me Rivu. Well, it's nice to meet you, Momo replied as Takoyami approached. I can vouch for her. She rallied our small group well, he said. I lucked out and got some smart cookies like you, Rivu replied with a smile and a pat on Takoyami's head. The crow-headed boy glared up at her as Momo heard stifled giggles from Kaminari and Hagakure. Hey hey. And out from the boy's cloak was Dark Shadow. If he gets some I get some too. Dark Shadow, get back in there. Takoyami commanded. Awa, oh, I'd never let my favorite birdie go without some scratches Rivu cooed as she knelt and began to pet the beaming shadow demon who was smiling like a dog whose ears were being scratched. Momo had to look away and cover her giggles while Kaminari and Hagakure outright guffawed in laughter. Ha, this is the stuff. About the ghosts of Kyoto please. Takoyami grit out through clenched teeth and Momo coughed as she looked back, seeing her group. Takage stood by with an amused grin. All right then. Rivu patted Dark Shadow one last time and stood up. Game time, people. On cue, they felt the ground rumble beneath them. Must be the arena changing like before at the sports festival. Takage surmised. All right everyone. Momo called out, looking at the mass of students. Our enemy is best genus, and his presumed minions will be those who have worked in his agency. So expect hot iron, hairspray and trimmer to act as his lieutenants. They have poison gas tanks that they plan to use to storm the bureau. Momo turned to Rivu. How good is your team of fighters? Pretty good I say. Rivu showed off her flashy canines. Can I trust you to find which of the minions have the gas tanks? Takage grinned. Way ahead of ya. We can focus on the civilians too. Momo nodded, feeling a little assurance. If we can neutralize Genus, do so. Otherwise focus on the civilians. There should be a safe area to take them. Momo's arms were flowing as she made walkie-talkies and handed them out. Use these to keep in contact. It's all on the same frequency, she said, producing more and more. She even saw the perpetual malcontent Shishikura take one, although he glared at it as if it took lunch money from him. Right? Hagakure chirped with a shake of her gloves, her calm unit in hand. Kaminari grinned with Romero as Habuko nodded. The doors opened behind them. Your provisional examination begins now. Momo turned and ran out the door. Already she began to take in the fact that they were in a unique environment. Before them lay a simple ziggurat-like looking building that acted as the government bureau. Eight floors. Let's get inside and she was cut off as she looked up, seeing a helicopter descend at the top of the building. The painted logo on the side had a skull in white blue flames with the characters of Kyoto at the bottom. And at the open door, the number three hero in Japan, Best Genus stood with three other well-dressed psychics, all in matching denim jumpsuits. She saw them jump down to the top of the ziggurat. Intercept them. Momo called out. We have to get the civilians out. Rivu's body changed, her bodysuit fitting perfectly as her human shape contorted into a blue-scaled serpentine dragon with water and moisture forming on her claws as she took off. Takoyami followed her with dark shadow, the monster morphing around him as he took off into the air. Black fallen angel that form was, Momo remembered from training. 
The black-haired girl also saw a boy with jet engines on his knees take off, followed by the fragments of Takage. Crap, it's gonna take ages for us to get up there. Kaminari yelled. Come on, right, let's go. She waved as they ran through the front door. The grapple gun and her web pellet paintball gun in hand, she aimed and took off. They had to get to the ghosts before they reached the ventilation room on the fifth floor. This is getting crowded, Shoto muttered, seeing how their massive group was crowding up the concourse. Yo, it's Todoroki, Hiroshima exclaimed as he ran forth with a big grin. Kendo's here. Awesome, now we're gonna pass for sure. And right beside the redhead was the steel-skinned Tetsu Tetsu. Classmates of yours, Intelli inquired as their group began to file in. Yeah, Kendo replied with a nod. Tetsu Tetsu is in my class, and Kirishima is in Todoroki's. She turned to her muscular peer. I see you're grouped up with him again. She asked with a wry smile. Oh you bet. Tetsu Tetsu exclaimed with a clenched fist and a thumb pointed his way. I thought we were going to have an issue but turned out pretty great. You can say that again bro. Kirishima said with a grin as wide as his steel-haired peer. Still, our firm was rather small, like, only five people. He said as he pointed at Shoto and the group behind him as they fanned out to give each other personal space. The other one only had like 6'2". How many are in your group? 80 plus, Nagamasa said behind Todoroki. Some of them are here as well actually. Seems like we weren't the only ones to come to the same conclusion. Hiroshima perked up. Oh hey, you're the hairy guy from Shikesu. And Kirishima Ijiro, he said, offering his hand with a big grin. Nagamasa accepted it. Nagamasa Mori, at your service. 80 plus people. Sheesh, how did you manage all of that? Tetsu Tetsu asked Kendo. The redhead gave Shoto a sideways glance. Manages overstating things. She muttered, Shoto was unfazed. It wasn't his responsibility to corral that bedlam and massive idiots to the right spot. We came up with the correct location and villain using Intelli's quirk and other factors. Nagamasa elaborated. Intelli meanwhile was cupping her mouth in thought, a thermos in her hand. Her brow was furrowed it had been all morning and her nervousness was gnawing on Shoto's own thinning patience and anxieties. All right then, came a voice over the loudspeaker and the dual quirk boy looked up, seeing the large screen flicker to life. So, that's where all the missing teams went. Mera mused through the screen. Missing teams. Well, let's first see who is supposed to be here. If your tag glows green, you pass the preliminary portion. Red, you fail. Now then, Mira reached over, clicking on something as Shoto looked at his tag. It was yellow. He felt a knife of incredulous shock punch him in the chest and judging by the sounds he wasn't the only one. Oh hey our tags are green. We pass. Kirishima beamed, turning towards Tetsu Tetsu whose tag also glowed green and clasped his hand in manly vigor. He then noticed everyone else talking up a storm on their changing color tags. Huh? Why are you guys yellow? Shoto took a moment to look around and indeed, he could see more yellow tags, and he noted that they were all from the various disparate members of his agency. Administrator, a female student with hair akin to chains stepped forward. What is the meaning of this? She pointed at her flashing yellow tag. Wait, he said missing teams. Intelli muttered, and her hands went to her face. What does he mean? Shoto asked, his voice a little hurried. I suppose we should fill you in. Teams Green 8 and Red 5 have passed fine, but for Teams Green 3 and Black 0, your situation is a bit more nuanced, Mira explained. It is true that the evidence provided to your trailers did have differing locations and attacks and villains, but unlike other agencies where double or triple leads were red herrings meant to mislead, for your agency, every lead presented to you was completely valid. A wave of mutterings and shouted questions were thrown at the monitor. Mira spoke over them. The evidence collected in your agency's points to attacks taking place right now, Mira explained. The point of this exam is to emulate hero agencies here in Japan. Tell me, what is the difference between your firm, Miss Green 33, he said, looking down at Kendo, and that of Mr. 98, standing close to you? Who? Me. Hiroshima tilted his head. Tetsu Tetsu lightly smacked his shoulder. Who else, idiot? Well, it's the size of our agencies, she said. Shoto felt the answer smack him in the face as Intelli muttered a whispered oh no. Behind him. Exactly. Now tell me, what do large agencies do when they have multiple leads for multiple locations? Something they're uniquely capable of doing by virtue of having so many members. They split their resources as needed. Shoto mumbled, feeling his blood turn colder by the second. How could he have been so stupid? Apparently Mira heard him. Ding ding, we have a winner. The man even went so far as to lift up and lazily wave a little flag. 
The fact is, your agencies were meant to split your members into various teams to support other agencies nearby who needed the extra manpower to take on their villain groups. You didn't. So, at the moment while this isn't an automatic failure, even with you successfully repelling this villain attack here, which let's be honest you are grossly overmatching on sheer numbers alone at this point, your passing the provisional exam now entirely depends on how many other attacks succeed or fail without your participation. If a majority of the teams counting on your support manage to pull it off, then you pass. If they don't, then you fail. Simple, really. And then there's how you perform in the upcoming exam as well. The wall of noise and protests bellowed out of the stadium like a wave but Shoto didn't have time for such. He only had one question as he rounded on the pale and sick-looking in telly. She had a hand over her mouth as her eyes darted back and forth, and she went back to guzzling from her thermos. How many other leads were there? He barked, including ours eight. She answered. He quickly turned, starting to do a head count of how many other members of his agency were here to try and get an idea of how many had been left high and dry. Oh, and given how much manpower you'll have for this exam, there will be a stricter point threshold for passing as well. Mira explained. Shota wanted to kick himself right now. Normally, the point deduction system we will be employing has a pass-fail threshold of 50 points. But given your immense numbers, your threshold will be 65 points. Fall to 64 and you fail. Now who wants to tell me the mission parameters here? More yelling, protests and groans. Shoto grit his teeth, feeling his fingers clench. Damn it, this really wasn't good. Kendo stepped past him. Our mission is to save a hero school. She elaborated. Our villain is targeting the Sutunri Junior Hero Academy. And who is this villain, Miss Green 33? Mira asked. Seikaiyo and the Hateful Eight. Their objective is to kill the children and teachers at the school, all of whom have quirks. Seikaiyo is our only opponent who has a quirk of some kind, utilizing physical brute force. Kendo elaborated. Shoto took a moment to look around, finding Intelli gnawing on a nail, no doubt calculating their highly reduced chances at passing. Nagamasa remained silent, inscrutable under the mountain of hair that was his quirk. She's your class rep. Reminds me of Yeyurazu, Hiroshima exclaimed. They plan to use firearms. Kendo continued. Several gunmen with military equipment while Seikaiyo will use her quirk. Hamira nodded lightly in approval. Very well, best of luck heroes. Make your way to the starting gate. You have 10 minutes. Take note, with your manpower, the villains won't be as generous as the other villains are in the other examinations. If anything, they'll only respond with greater force when pushed into a corner. And the screen blacked out. All right, let's move everyone. Tetsutestu called out as he jogged forward by Kendo's side. Let's kick some villain ass. Let's group up Todoroki. Hiroshima said as he gestured to him to follow. You wanna come too, Nagamasa, if you insist. The hair-covered boy looked down at Intelli. Will you be all right, Seiko? Why yes, Intelli nodded, taking a deep breath. Just needed a moment. Once we are in, I'll have to set up. Shoto nodded, turning and walking ahead through the crowd with Kirishima and Nagamasa at both sides. He came to the front before long, seeing Kendo talk with Tetsu Tetsu and a girl with the claws and face of a mole. So, our plan for attack is to neutralize the villains fast, right? Tetsu Tetsu asked. Kendo nodded. We have the numbers advantage as they said, and they only have one quirk user. That alone tells how frightening this guy is gonna be. She looked out, seeing everyone else arguing. She sighed and rubbed her temples. This is gonna be a nightmare. She took a deep breath. The doors aren't open yet. She muttered suddenly, then tapped Shoto on the shoulder. Hey, I need somewhere to stand high. Shoto raised an eyebrow wondering what she was asking him for when he caught her eyebrow raised expectantly and realized what she was requesting. Part of his pride chafed at being relegated to a footstool. The other part of him realized his margin for passing or failing this exam was far 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 more thin than he liked right now. With a shift of his foot Kendo was suddenly standing on a block of ice four feet tall, quite literally towering over the room. She yelped, nearly losing her footing on the slick surface before she found her stability, and let out a shrill whistle to catch the attention of those who hadn't noticed her sudden elevation in height. Two fingers in her mouth let her make a sound that made Shoto wince where he stood, and sent his ears ringing. Hey, guys, she called. Team leads or whoever we need to start making a plan like right freaking now. Agreed. Nagamasa called in sharp support. If we all just run in there, with every team acting on their own, we will fail, even if we have a supposed numbers advantage. There were several seconds of muttering. 
quick designations of team leads and other such moves before a cavalcade of what the various teams seemed to designate as their captains marched up to the block of ice. All right, so Kendo clapped her hands. We've got three groups, combat, escort, and searchers. Combat's self-explanatory. They're the ones that have to fight the bad guys. These are our fighting quirks. Escorts are our support or non-combat quirks. They get the civilians out of the fighting grounds and searchers are people who can move fast or have quirks suited to searching large areas quickly. Just because it's a fake school doesn't mean they won't have some of the civilian kids hiding away somewhere not in class. Shoto listened as Nagamasa and several others volunteered to lead the combat team. Frankly, he didn't care who led. He wasn't a people person and had no interest in the role. As long as everyone stayed relatively out of his way, he could fight freely without worrying too much about collateral damage, making this situation a relatively simple fight. His eyes could freeze the whole stadium in an instant if push came to shove after all. The escort and searcher teams were smaller than the combat team, either because more people wanted the glory or because they just had that many combat quirks. He couldn't really say. The plan as far as it went was basic, but basic in this case was good when there were so many unknown moving parts. He only recognized a handful of people in this crowd and judging by the number of cliques people were gravitating towards, like Kirishima and Tetsutetsu with him and Kendo, that was likely true across the board. They didn't know each other's quirks, abilities, dispositions, skills, temperament, reliability, or anything else. Very few agencies could ever or would ever work like this unless it was a true emergency. Before anything more could be hashed out the buzzer went off, the warning light beginning to flare bright yellow before the doors opened and it was time to get moving. Filing through with the rest of the group Shoto found the school grounds made for them. Three buildings not dissimilar to an old-fashioned boarding school. They were square, squat things for the most part, with the third building being three stories where the others were only two, perhaps eight rooms per floor. It wasn't an insignificant amount of ground to cover but given their numbers it likely wouldn't be a challenge to search or at least not as much of a challenge as it potentially could have been if they had the appropriate number of people meant for this exam. Come on, let's go faster, someone said, and like that the crowd of examinees rushed forward, all but sprinting across the lawn towards the school grounds. Shoto was no exception, but his eyes moved back and forth, searching for where the villain team might make their approach. There were only a few cargo-sized doors in the open baseball stadium, as the school wouldn't fit inside a normally enclosed arena. That could be open to admit a group of any significant size to the arena at once and all were a fair distance away, giving them plenty of warning. The second their feet hit the courtyard proper orders were being shouted out. Form a perimeter around the grounds, Nagasama demanded, split yourselves in groups of three. Call for backup immediately if you hear or see anything. Come on Todoroki, Kirishima smacked his shoulder, startling him. Frankly he'd completely blanked on the redhead's presence. Following him and Tetsu Tetsu, they made their way to the eastern side of the practice area. Slipping between the buildings he could already see the escort and searcher team starting to move. Various kids with big printed number signs on their shirts, all excited to watch the exam, were being filed out in short order. Where are they he thought to himself. He didn't have to wonder much longer. When the blow came it came fast, unbelievably fast. There was no explosion, no sudden door opening or warning. One second they were in the relative calm of the faux school grounds. The next, villains were literally firing from all around them. They burst from beneath the loose sand of the arena grounds, emerging from maintenance tunnels and hidden boxes, the mouth of their ramps leading upwards, having been seemingly hidden there this whole time, waiting. They came up with weapons raised and it was only on pure panicked reflex that had Shoto bring up an ice wall that saved him, Kirishima, and Tetsu Tetsu from being hosed down with automatic fire. Other combat team members weren't so lucky. He saw several of them get hit, the red from the paint balls mimicking real blood so much Shoto almost believed for a moment that they'd been shot for real, especially as they hit the ground with screams of genuine pain. The villain group surged forward, tightening the noose like a constricting predator. Hey, get back here, someone shouted behind him. Whirling back around to look, he saw kids, several of them, running, sprinting away from the main group. Some of them were caught by other hero hopefuls before they made it too far but one moved past the line of combat team members now openly fighting the villains, slipping towards the villain lines at the stadium seats. One of the villains straightened up and pointed down, pulling a second trigger twice on the weapon, releasing puffs of air that ruffled the kid's shirt and hair, before planting a hand on his shoulder. The kid sat down on the sands of the arena, the little sign on his shirt turning to a bright red X. Shoto's teeth were grinding now. 
panicking civilians to add to the chaos. Panicking civilians who, if they got killed would make things even harder, points wise. And to top it off the little help me company bastard was grinning, pleased at having succeeded at dying. Go I'm DEIing. One of the villains rounded the corner of his ice wall, and with a slap of Shoto's hand against the cold surface the ice moved again, a thin spear bursting out of the wall to skewer the weapon in the man's hand and ripping it out of his fingers. The goon recovered quickly, ducking low under the spear, and to Shoto's surprise, drawing a knife and coming straight at him hand to hand. Very few if any ever got close enough to fight him in melee, and for a moment the Todoroki prodigy was struck almost stupid at the fact. He stepped back, dodging swipes from the knife with a painted edge before he got his bearings and shifted his foot to freeze the man like a winter carnival statue. Then Kirishima slammed into the guy like a linebacker and crushed him against the wall. Come on, the redhead demanded. We gotta go help. Shoto turned, seeing some gunmen still raining fire on the heroes as they had recuperated and were taking defensive positions. He saw some kids form a wall of earth, others using their quirks to act as human shields like one slime boy and a girl made of some sort of rubber. Tetsu Tetsu was suddenly and violently thrown into a concrete wall with enough force to crack it. Shoto's head whipped about, scanning the courtyard. A massive chunk of earth erupted around the students as if a missile had crashed into it. Hero hopefuls being sent flying as he turned in surprise. A shape moved within the massive cloud of dust and debris, causing the dust cloud to part almost instantly. My my, seems like Endeavor's little pup has come to play. A little old woman with whitish pink hair and dressed in a red chung sam with a black bodysuit underneath stood there. She might be small, but she was not hunched over, standing proud as the screams from the heroes, children, and teachers began to ring out. Shoto felt his fire come to life. This had to be her. Come on everyone. Kendo was rallying the befuddled heroes. Let's get her. HM. The old woman made a sound, raising her hands as her fingers moved in a flicking motion. What came next was like being smacked in the face by typhoon gales. Shoto grit his teeth, digging in his heels to form icy footholds to stop himself from flying back. The winds died down, but most of the attackers were now far from the older woman who still stood perfectly still. Memories of the sports festival flooded into him. Her quirk, is it as strong as Midoriya's? Shoto noticed more men appear from the hidden bunker entrances under the sands, rushing forward towards the school. With a grunt, Shoto unleashed his fire towards the incoming armored men in black, but another strong gust dispersed his flames as he looked and saw that Seikaiyo had flicked in their general direction. Come now boy, the old woman snarked. Should you really be focused on them? Shoto fired a massive ice surge her way, and the little woman who was standing perfectly still a moment ago was gone. Air erupting where she last stood as if someone had taken flight. He looked up and saw her in the air. As projectiles and laser beams came rushing at her, he saw her barely move her arm, aiming at his way as Shoto braced himself. The typhoon gale-like push sent him into the ice walls he'd set up prior. He bounced off them and rolled across the ground, causing Shoto to take even longer before he could steady himself. He saw her land, but not before firing another power flick to the ground to slow her descent. Take the eyes, yelled some students as they charged. Shoto could see a large one with hands like wrecking balls. Another came rushing in while looking like a massive hulking crocodile. Wrecking ball boy came in with a mighty right hook. Her hand rose, almost languid like as the back of her knuckles wrapped against the oncoming steel ball and sent the youth's fist crashing into the dirt beside her. With a solid whack of her cane across his face the kid's head whipped about and then a barely their thumb flick on his forehead sent him skidding across the floor, carving a trench with his bare back. Seikaiyo pivoted, avoiding the chomp from the crocodile boy's jaws, bending like a leaf in the wind as she swerved to the boy's side with grace unbecoming of her age. Her shoulder was right beside the titanic mutant boy's ribs, and with the barest of movements, the reptilian youth was knocked back. The impact visibly hurt him as he held his stomach and fell into a kneeling position in the dirt. She turned, raising an eyebrow towards Shoto. He felt nervousness swell within his stomach. Kendo, Tetsu Tetsu, and the others were running towards the school where the mercs were trying to reach the civilians. That look in your eyes, much like your father's, the old woman said, and Shoto blinked, feeling a boiling anger swell within him. Hum, yes, exactly that. Now would you humor this old soul? She mused. Don't disappoint me. She doesn't want to be disappointed, ha. Huh? The flames roared and the ice at his feet spread out, cracking the earth as he glared at her. Bring it. Seikaiyo chuckled as more students began to charge in, her arms loose and ready. The new generation gets all of the fancy stuff these days. Big stadiums, buildings for simulations. They didn't have these back in my day. The thought moved through Toshinori's mind as he stepped into the stadium, but he honestly couldn't help himself. 
Back in his day, the license exam was little more than an internship. You proved yourself in the situations that you could control in the field. There weren't enough heroes to hold the line as there were today. Nice place, Melissa commented, but Tashinori could already see her trying to look through the different monitors to find her friends as they sat in the arena. Tashinori himself spotted a few of them, wincing at the opponents everyone was facing. He knew the call for help went out far, but it was still a strange sight to see his peers within the top 10 heroes on screen. It isn't for tourists. Tashinori turned, and Melissa flinched a little. Aizawa only gave either of them a sideways glance before returning his tired attention to the screen. Well, there's nothing to say that other teachers can't join in, Tashinori explained. Another flicker of a gaze from Aizawa, this one lingering on Tashinori's smaller form and Melissa taking a seat in the bleacher in front of her. The eraser hero gave a long sigh, seemingly piecing everything together right then and there before Yagi even got the chance to sit down. How are they doing? Aizawa shrugged. They haven't failed yet. Tashinori's brow flicked up slightly. That almost sounds like praise. I saw Vlad steaming a while back. Some of his students must have failed in the preliminaries. Aizawa just hummed, looking up at the screen, frowning at what he saw. Tashinori looked up and shuddered as he saw young Todoroki be sent flying by the force from a flick from that old woman. They're fighting all Seikaiou. Melissa turned to him, a curious expression on her face. You know her. Tashinori chuckled. Yeah, back before even my time, she was an accomplished hero, he explained. I'm surprised she was willing to come out of retirement for this, Tashinori commented. She was convinced when she saw the participant list, Aizawa lazily said, tired eyes drifting over to the screens. A few names there inspired her, apparently. Tashinori shivered. If Seikaiyo got inspired, she usually wound up devastating the countryside, hence her being more of a rural hero. Those poor kids. Peter tapped on his wrist, his web shooters activating as his HUD began to light up, outlining Orca's minions and the big whale man himself. The big guy was in red, his minions in orange pouring out of the drill tank, troop transport which looked as big as an RV, Peter's allies in blue and the civilians in green. He could see Shindo and Monoma touch hands, a large mass of vines sprouting out from Shizaki's hair, and began moving quickly to collect and shield the civilians. And then Orca rushed towards them like a runaway train. Peter leapt into a backflip right before the massive Orca's hand slammed down in the space where the boy once was, crushing the tile. He twisted in midair, trying to kick the large beastman. But the pro's hand shot up, catching the kick and swinging him like a bat before releasing the young hero. Peter felt his back hit something hard as he heard a shout of pain and surprise. Watch it Parker. Back Hugo screamed, unleashing a series of explosions as he took off and roared, striking at some of the black armored minions and sending them flying, avoiding bolts of those goo guns. He turned as he aimed for Orca, raising his hands he let out a roar as fire and fury surged outwards. Orca raised an arm, protecting his face as he pushed his hand into the ground grabbing a piece of tile with his bare hands and chucking it at Bakugo, who ducked and dodged to the side. Orca moved faster than anyone of his size had any right to, blocking a sparkling green blur that was trying to go for his blind spot. Izuku grit his teeth as Orca swung his arm, and the boy was sent flying from his backhand. Several of the minions got into a firing line, leveling their guns onto Shoji and Ibarra. Peter shot up to his feet, webbing lashing out to grab the first gun before they could open fire. A single yank knocked the man into his partner and gave Shoji the moment that he needed as he sprinted forward. Octo Lariat. Four arms crashed into two guards, hitting them hard in the chest and sending them flying. However, the other villains rallied instantly, pulling out batons and knives to engage in close combat. L was right by Shoji's side, and to Peter's surprise, her arms swinging with what seemed to be white spikes coming out of her arms batting aside knives and batons. Hurry up. She screamed, weapons clashing I got my roll, do yours. Shoji nodded right. He turned and rushed away. Peter saw Kami doing the same as she gathered some civilians to run out of the lobby. Orca moved, dodging blasts from Bakugo and weaving between strikes from Izuku. A swing of his massive arm nearly caught Peter as he jumped in to assist. You're all blind, he said, I am not the threat here. Peter could see the ghost of a smirk and fangs poking out of his mouth. After all, I'm here to kill all of the ones responsible for polluting our planet. Peter's eyes narrowed behind his mask, and then it clicked the moment he heard it. The ticking. Peter's head snapped to the tank, and on the side, a clock started ticking down. He heard a cocky scoff from the whaleman as he looked his way. Peter leapt over him, launching off the villain's fist like a gymnast. It gave him a moment to see everything shift around him the civilians being taken away on vines, and a flash of green that started darting around the edge of the battlefield. 
So, at the apex of the flip, Peter shot out his webs, both ropes of the white stuff grabbing onto Orca's back. Minnesota vow. Orca was struck in the gut by a charging Izuku, who staggered him with a flying kick. Smash. The whaleman stumbled a few steps. Peter chucked a web bomb straight at him, timing the detonation as the hero recovered with a shake of his head. It went off and Orca became a white gunk-covered heap, struggling to break free. Peter fired more webbing, pelting him to keep him rooted as he heard yelling and screaming behind him. Peter turned, still seeing some of Orca's minions running towards anything that wasn't them. Any leftover civilians, his teammates, and towards the staircase. He saw two big masses of vines at the balcony depositing the bunches of civilians as some were running up the stairs, courtesy of Kami's escort. Shindo placed his hands to the ground. Peter felt the earth rumble and shake before it exploded, striking some of the minions as tile and earth rose up from Shindo's quirk. Vibrate, creating a makeshift barricade between the villains and the stairs. Peter heard Orca roar as he broke free of the webbing. The villain turned, glaring his way, micro-machine harpoon spear in hand. Peter knelt down, hand to the floor. Bring it free Willy. He saw the whaleman charge, leaping up with a roar. Peter jumped out of the way from the crater the man made with his landing before firing two web shots past the man, yanking himself forward like a slingshot to slam both feet into Orca's head, knocking the whale man on his ass. Orca rolled with the blow, smoothly reaching his feet as his red eye glared at Peter. Peter felt his sense flare up. The air seemed to distort for a second, and Peter's legs pushed him to the side, jumping out of the way of something. The hell was that? Peter muttered to himself as Orca rose. He aimed his webbed shooters, going into burst mode as he fired in a rapid-fire staccato to bind him. Orca reached down, ripping a slab free from the ground to stand as a physical shield as Peter rushed forward, using the shield himself to close the distance again. Sense flare. Peter twisted in mid-air, firing his web shooter before he pulled hard. Fire and fury erupted, blasting apart the dividing barrier between him and Orca. It caught the whale man, making him yell in pain. The American couldn't see him as he skidded back from the shockwave, the heat rushing over him. Peter landed and turned, glaring hard at Bakugo as he tossed aside the pin from his grenade gauntlet. Are you serious? Peter barked in anger. You were able to dodge with your precog. Quit being a pussy. Bakugo yelled as he took off into the sky and towards Orca, only for the smoke to seemingly part and Bakugo, to his credit, blasted to the side, avoiding the invisible shockwave. Peter changed his web shooters to full burst and aimed two large web bullets that drained his remaining reserve in the current cartridge at the center of the smoke, reloading on the spot. He saw Orca leap out of the debris cloud, cape flared and arm wide. His eyes curved in a dark grin. Seems like I need to up the ante. Orca mused. Now, let's see how you handle this. Peter rushed in and Orca turned, swinging with a backhand that seemed ridiculously fast. Had the man been holding back? His sense screamed, and he brought up his arms to defend as the strike caught him and sent him flying backwards. He rolled across the ground, getting back on his feet as his arms throbbed. That was actually gonna bruise. Sense, he dropped, and Orca's jaws clamped down where his head would have been. You're trying to eat me. Peter barked, jumping back and firing more webbing as Orca wisely covered his eyes. Peter felt his sense tingle and he aimed at the wall before he fired and pulled, avoiding another invisible blast. Where was it coming from? You're fighting me, Orca. Back Hugo yelled as he blasted towards Orca. He aimed his palms and fired. Orca met the attack, rushing in with a speed that caught Buck Hugo unawares, and he barely avoided a swipe from Orca's mighty paw. Peter landed on the wall, looking back as he reloaded his web shooters. He felt his sense tingle, avoiding a hail of foam bullets from some minions that took aim his way as he dodged and ran across the wall. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Izuku and El moving across the battlefield, finding any minions and knocking them out as best they could, trying to clear out the last of the stragglers before pressing the attack on Orca. He saw Bakugo blast away at Orca, but the whale man was unperturbed, almost smiling as he kept the blonde bomber on the back foot. Peter pivoted and pushed off the wall, rocketing towards Orca. He fired his web shooters and they latched onto the man's shoulders. He pulled, aiming to yank him off balance. Orca had other plans. Reaching up and behind him the man grabbed hold of the webs, yanking Peter off the ground. At the end of a lasso, the boy from Queens was smashed into a body. He heard a cry of pain as they met the ground and skidded away. Peter groaned. Get the fuck off me. Back Hugo snarled, kicking the wall crawler off before stumbling to his feet. Orca. Back Hugo yelled, blasting off with a back blast of fire and force not dissimilar to a grenade going off that caused Peter to stumble backwards and against the debris. He snarled. 
You're the fucking worst. Peter yelled as he fired a web line and swung after Buck Hugo as Orca rolled his neck and got into a stance. H-O-W-I-T-Z-E-R. Beck Hugo spun rapidly, rushing in close like an actual missile, only for the bomber to stop dead mid-flight. His momentum was violently reversed with enough force that it would likely cause the blonde whiplash by tomorrow. He brought his hands together in front of Orca's face. Stun grenade. A fury of light and sound erupted in Orca's face. The whale man cried out at being blinded. Before either of them could press the attack, more of the minions whipped around, breaking off their attack on the civilians. They laid down cover fire for their boss, forcing Beck Hugo and Peter on the defensive. Mid-leap Peter stumbled, a glob of rapidly hardening goop catching him at the ankle, and Beck Hugo too was knocked out of the sky as his hand was swallowed up by its own direct hit. Both of them turned, glaring hard at the black-covered goons. Get lost. F off. They yelled as one before Back Hugo fired another full blast and sent the minions flying. Peter fired a full cartridge burst and got several of them as he landed, ducked, and dodged. Leaping rapidly, he knocked out each unlucky villain with a straight punch to the jaw. Once, twice, thrice, four times and four minions went down. He turned and webbed up an unfortunate minion as the wall crawler stood and felt the foam harden his foot to the ground. Peter tugged on the webbing and slammed the minion down on the ruined tile floor. He bent down and bashed the hardened foam on his foot with a fist. Just in time too as his sense flared and Peter leapt away from Orca and his trident. The man then swung in a wide arc, Peter feeling the tip of the dull blade nearly catch his chest. However Orca pivoted and with his motion, swung the weapon towards a rapidly approaching Beck Hugo. The boy was caught by the spinning weapon and fell from the sky like a stunned bird as Peter aimed. Only for the whale man to turn, red eyes gleaming in battle lust as he ripped out a chunk of concrete in the same smooth motion and hurled it at him, catching Peter in the chest as it knocked the wall crawler end over end. Is this all you have? Orca yelled, arms wide as he showed off those sharp teeth. Next all may the it. Peter was halfway to his feet before Orca was on him, his punch catching him in the chest and sending him flying across the room and into the wall. Peter's vision was spotty as he coughed in his mask while his HUD sputtered and flickered. Peter got back up, hand against a chunk of debris as he felt the soreness in his chest with each deep breath he took, and he heard a yelp of pain and Back Hugo was sent flying through some tiles and debris from a weaponized piece of rubble. Peter reloaded his cartridges and glared at Orca as he approached him. Come on, Peter uttered, and he ran back into the fray as he heard the roar of Back Hugo charging in with him. Itsuka was frantic, running towards the school with a mole boy named Mamatero, Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu. Behind her was Nijima, a girl with a straw doll-like body from another school who was legging it with Kaibara. That opening salvo by Seikaiyo was downright brutal, and had taken out almost a fifth of the hero candidates immediately. The girl kicked herself for not being able to see it sooner. The right amount of hero candidates meant that a small group would be able to get Seikaiyo's attention while the others would be able to go to the school and save the civilians. Instead, they had the equivalent of a JSDF battalion of hero prospects. Too many people, too chaotic and clustered. It was a perfect chance for the old heroine to cut loose and for those trained soldiers to take the initiative and go to the school. The HPSC had brought in legit commandos to play the role of villains. Or had these guys been switched into handle groups like hers that were over the expected strength parameters of what they were supposed to have? A scary thought. But Parker, Todoroki, Midoriya, and Yeyurazu from Klasa had fought against similar foes on I Island according to Vlad Sensei. Well, time to measure up. Can't believe we lost some people at the start already. Mamatero griped. He was a nasally boy with a large nose and small eyes that looked huge behind his goggles. But his sharp mole claws were perfect for digging. Nothing we can do now. Tetsu Tetsu chimed in. He saw a door up ahead. All right, coming Thrawug. He roared as he busted down the door. The shooters went up top. Itsuka said as they ran inside, slowing their run. The redhead could hear the roaring and screams outside combined with the sound of windows being shattered. Get them away from the side of the school where the fighting is. Put them in opposing classrooms, Itsuka declared, seeing a camera out of the corner of her eye. Hiroshima, Tetsu Tetsu, take the lead. She turned towards Mamatero. Can you dig us some tunnels to help protect the civilians too? The more protection and places to hide, the better. She opened a janitor's closet and the mole boy grinned. You can count on me. He cheered as he dove, his claws and arms pumping as he punctured through tile and concrete with ease. Itsuka turned towards Nijima and Kaibara. Kaibara, you and I are the main attackers. What's your quirk like, Nijima-san? I have the constitution of a straw doll. I can be nimble and strong in grappling and take a light pounding, but I'd rather not get a strong pellet or anything flammable sent my way. 
the black-haired girl with blonde drills in her hair exclaimed. Okay, stairs. Itsuka yelled as she remembered the layout. She could hear gunfire topside. Hiroshima, Kaibara, and Nijima take the nearest set of stairs. She pointed to said location down the hallway of the school. Me and Tetsutsu will handle the farthest one. Meet you topside dude. Hiroshima said, giving a thumbs up towards Tetsu Tetsu as the dainty looking girl and black haired youth ran up the stairs. Likewise, Tetsu Tetsu turned towards Itsuka and nodded. Let's go, class rep. It's battle fist. Itsuka heard more screaming and wind rattling as she opened a door. Behind it she could see the kids and teacher hiding under the desks in the classroom. This way. Move move move. Tetsu Tetsu yelled. Oh, heroes, said a kid with a very deep voice and looked. A bit gaunt. We're saved. Another exclaimed with a nasally squeaky voice. Yep, definitely not grade schoolers. Itsuka ushered them through, opening the door as kids began to file out quickly into the other classroom where other civilians had been gathered already. All of a sudden, she heard an explosion go off directly above them on the third floor. Itsuka perked up, as did her steel-haired friend as the kids now bolted for the other classroom. Running up the emergency stairs, Tetsu Tetsu was right behind her as she ran, enlarging her fist as she rushed towards where she heard screaming. Punching the door, she sent it flying across the room where it served as a shield to the rubber bullets that punched through the window. The villain was right outside the glass. Lucky break. Go. She ordered as she ran ahead, yelling as she jumped on a chair and then out the window at the stunned-looking jetpack-wearing soldier. She brought her big fists down at a slam, making the soldier fall and the jetpack crunching under the impact. The mono, woman given the shape of her figure, rolled away before she raised her rifle and took aim. With a roar, Tetsu Tetsu leapt out of the window, grabbing hold of the woman in a flying, falling tackle to knock her down. Itsuka rushed in, closing the distance, her giant expanded hand striking the woman right in the gut. The blow sent her flying multiple yards and she landed on the pavement in a roll. How are the kids? She asked. The steel-haired boy looked her way and grinned. Safe and sound, he said, looking ahead and seeing that the villain was both unresponsive and unmoving. We don't got anything to restrain her, do. Itsuka reached into her thigh satchel, pulling out some simple zip ties. I got it covered. After this, we head to the upper floors and help the others. Tetsu Tetsu's grin was wide enough to split his face as Itsuka went on ahead. That's our big sis of class 1B. Itsuka couldn't help but smile and shake her head. But the good feeling was gone as she felt more gusts of wind from the battle raging in the stadium and the courtyard. Momo rolled across the floor, biting back a curse. She was not having a good time right now. The primary reason for that conclusion was the absolutely pungent smell of hairspray that literally made her eyes water and her mouth gag. Through a gas mask, she could still smell the citrusy scent. Hairspray's quirk was exactly what it said on the tin as she came out of cover and fired her paintball rifle. The more acidic his foods that included processed meats, cheeses and onions, the more concentrated the resulting hairspray, almost to the point of being seemingly poisonous. His fingers had hairspray nozzles at the end joints, and he wore a gas mask similar to her own. The poison gas canister had to be in his backpack. Hairspray ducked behind cover, avoiding the web bullets as Momo's hands began glowing. A brave soul with jet boosters for legs charged in, trying to get Hairspray to come on out. However, Momo could hear the coughing, the grunts, and the hits that they were taking. But, her tool was finished. She tossed a flashbang down the corridor. Earplugs conjured in her ears as she heard the bang accompanied by a shout of surprise and minor pain. She turned, seeing Hairspray stagger as she began to pelt him full of web. The repeated impacts and the growing white gunk pinned him to the wall as he struggled and cursed. She made sure to shoot for the hands, binding the nozzles against the wall, and smothered them in web. Hairspray down, Momo said into her walkie-talkie, speaking aloud in an effort to compensate for the gas mask. Hot iron is being tricky. Hey, Takoyami, send in dark shadow. It can take the heat. We're on the sixth floor. I like it but I ain't doing thaw dark shadow's response was cut off as Momo looked around, taking off the gas mask and panting as she heard yelling downstairs and in the general vicinity. So far the majority of the hero team was able to enter through the ground floor. Looking down from her place on the roof, she saw many civilians departing towards the safe zone outside. Momo moved towards the stairwell, making the turn as she remembered the layout of the floors from the group's research. The door to the stairwell burst open as water surged out of it. Momo backed off and conjured a hand mirror, using the mirror to peek outside while using the wall for cover. The inside of the halls consisted of widespread carnage, and some walls were scorched. A denim-covered hero with massive steel protrusions on his hands that were glowing red was swiping and dodging with grace from a smaller dark shadow. 
hot iron barreled through a wall before lunging for Takoyami himself. He was strong. Or perhaps the denim was a support item that increased his strength and durability. She walked down the hall with her paintball rifle, tossing away the mirror. Wincing at the heat searing on the walls, she turned, seeing a fire extinguisher in its casing. Taking the butt of her paintball rifle, she smashed it open as she heard the sounds of combat from another hallway. She peeked around it, seeing hot iron batting away dark shadow, and making the shadow monster yelp in pain as it retreated and shrank. She saw Rivu dive in, and Hot Iron simply sidestepped her attack. He came down hard on the dragon girl's back, Rivu yelling in pain. Get off of her. The denim-clad man turned, and was struck by Takoyami as he swung his arm. Dark shadow forming around his limb into a giant claw despite his smaller size from the light sources. The man rolled away, the metal irons that made his hands blazing red once more. Rivu struggled to get up, seething as Momo took aim, firing several shots and hitting the villain in the chest. The man yelped and staggered as white gunk appeared. As he moved the hot irons on his hands in an attempt to remove the webbing, Rivu roared, firing a surge of water at him and sending him crashing through a wall. Momo heard footsteps and turned, seeing scared civilians behind her. W we were trapped. And Momo nodded, running back to the fire extinguisher and grabbing it. Takoyami, she yelled, the raven-headed boy turning as Momo threw the red canister with all her might down the hall. Dark Shadow caught it perfectly. Dark Shadow, Takoyami commanded as he charged, his shadow monster carrying the extinguisher. I, eat this, overalls. Dark Shadow cried as he hurled it at the stunned hot iron. The canister exploded into foam upon contact when the foul villain brought up his iron hands to defend himself from the incoming projectile. Rivu roared, charging and twirling her body. Kairyu, water surged around her claws and face as she sped right towards the stunned villain, twirling as the water formed around her like a drill. The attack struck him dead on with Momo hearing the villain scream as she slammed him into a wall. Momo felt relief as she turned towards the civilians who were hiding in the other room. There are other villains on the lower floors fighting downstairs. They have poison gas canisters. Go to the roof. You'll be safe there. Thank you heroes, the civilians said as they trotted past. Momo then heard them mull amongst themselves. They aren't half bad, she heard them say. She trotted down the hall, seeing Rivu take the backpack off of Hot Iron's back. Geez, this thing is heavy. They were fighting us with this weighing them down. Rivu winced, the serpent girl turning towards Momo and Takoyami. So, that's too right. All that's left now is Trimmer and Genist. They're down below, trying to get to the air ducts no doubt. Takoyami said. Indeed, the air conditioning control system is there. Momo activated her walkie. Status on civilian evacuations. Her hands conjured handcuffs which she passed to Dark Shadow who used them to restrain the unconscious villain. You're under arrest bub. Dark Shadow jeered. He's totally your inner self right. Rivu said with a smirk. The cloaked boy rolled his eyes. We're ferrying them all out. Romero replied. We got a combat team heading up to the fourth floor where the AC unit is. Better hurry. Kaminari and Habuko went with them. Good work. Keep at it. Momo hung up and turned towards her two comrades. Shall we? Rivu smirked, tossing the backpack containing the gas off to the side. The combat team hasn't responded back. Takoyami mused. Genus may have taken care of them, or they're pinning them down. Momo mused as she turned around. We need to hurry down below and... Hey yeah Momo, Rivu spoke, and Momo turned, eyes befuddled at the dragon girl's casual use of a nickname only reserved for class as she had a sharp-toothed grin. Forget the stairs, I got an idea. Jeez, Satsuna yelled, backing off as she avoided the slash of Trimmer. Like the other psychics, he too was covered in support company denim, his hands a complete mishmash of scissors and shaving razor blades. Trimmer smirked as Satsuna retreated via her floating body, grateful that her costume only had organic mesh material made from her skin cells. One of her eyes was focused on the casually approaching best genus. All around him, various other hero students were either on the ground or their knees, their costumes betraying them as Genus had manipulated the linens to bind them up. I won't let you, Satsuna yelled, seeing Genus move towards the air conditioning room. If he got there and had the canisters and the backpacks inserted into the vents, it'd be game over for the civilians still inside. Satsuna split herself up into countless pieces. Trimmer, Genus ordered. Don't hurt her too much. She needs to choke on her failure. Trimmer, grinning like a madman, charged with his bladed hands as he leapt forth, performing a corkscrew motion as she did the best she could to split her body even further to avoid the worst of the damage. Even so, she had placed her torso and upper arms in front as a barrier, bearing the brunt of Trimmer's blunt-bladed assault. Obviously he would go blunt considering that he was a hero, and this was just an exam. 
but damn that hurt. Genus was walking casually towards the air room as Satsuna gained on him, her fragments coming back together to form hands her legs and her face. She decided to take the canister, bite his neck and choke him out using her thighs. She saw something drop out of Genus' sleeve and onto the ground as her body was about to form back together, only for something to explode out, all fluffy and tight-like as Satsuna gawked in surprise. She wasn't able to move. What the hell? She yelled, seeing what had been dropped. It was. Yarn. Her face bits were stuck. She attempted to force the rest of herself forwards, arms and la. More yarn balls fell out, and the strands all caught her pieces as Satsuna cried out. Forty-five pieces. That was as many as she could make. Best genus turned, eyes glaring at her. Perhaps you should have considered an alternate approach. The green-haired girl did her best to struggle, but the yarn was stuck to her, and to the walls, floor, and ceiling. Come trimmer. He reached into his pocket, pulling out respirators as Satsuna's eyes widened. Come on guys, said a voice, muffled by doors as Satsuna's eyes turned, and she saw even Genus turn slightly too. Satsuna recognized it. It was that Kaminari guy from Class A. She heard a rush of footsteps. He had backup but, Trimmer, you do the honors. He lifted the backpack of canisters up, and his sidekick took it before walking at a faster pace towards the ventilation room. Genus turned towards the stairwell door. Crap, we're gonna fail. Satsuna struggled as hard as she could, but she couldn't get out of the yarn. This isn't fair. Toshinori's eyes flickered towards his ward. Melissa's irritation at the tests had been growing with each hit that her fellow students took and every time that the great heroes of their time simply turned the table with a well-placed move. Frankly speaking, it wasn't fair, and the worst part about it was that most of them were holding back. He knew what Endeavor, Orca and Genus could really do. He'd fought alongside all of them enough times to see them prove why they were top 10 heroes. To throw them against students, children in the legal sense of the word, was almost cruel. Only, fighting villains never is, Aizawa explained without a hint of mercy. There is no code of conduct for some villains, while heroes are limited by a whole number of different things. Students have to prove that they can work against these impossible situations as best they can, or else they'll only be a hindrance in the field. But against top 10 heroes, Melissa complained. Aizawa looked pointedly at Yagi. The blonde felt himself sigh slightly. It's to make sure that they push themselves. Sometimes, there will be a situation where backup won't come, and you and your team are the only people standing between a villain and disaster. And regardless of the fairness, of the hardship, they have to keep going, Aizawa finished. In all honesty, I think everyone here hopes that these kids will never have to fight a battle at this scale, Yagi commented. Or, more accurately, he hoped they would never have to. Being the symbol of peace meant that he was the one that needed to take this load, make a better world where they didn't need to. But the world needed more symbols than just him. Here you go. Izuku set down the portly old man atop the atrium overlooking the lobby, which was becoming a decimated war zone in a hurry. Webbing patches, ruined upturned tile and flooring. The drill tank on the other side of the room made gathering civilians all the harder. Just follow the vines. My teammate is taking you to a safe zone. Thank you, the man said as he got up, joining other people that were running or limping to the hallway where Shizaki was. Not bad for a kid he muttered before departing. Izuku turned and jumped down the stairs, landing near Utsushimi who was blowing rainbow vapor from her lips behind upturned furniture. From her, various shimmering clones of himself, L, Peter and Shoji were rushing out to confuse and distract the minions. Izuku ran past Shindo and Monoma as L blitzed around the illusionary mist-covered battlefield, slashing and hacking with her bone blades and taking advantage of the confusion from a distance. Shoji was running about and doing the same but closer towards the escalator as to protect the one viable access point to the second floor into the safe zone. S-M-A-S-H. He shouted, vaulting over debris to punch one of the men in the side, knocking him into a wall. Turning to look at Shoji, he called out to the multi-armed boy. Any more civilians? Towards the windows, he yelled, playing the role of overseer of their rescue efforts. He ran towards the window area. He should be helping Peter and Kakin against Orca, but with so many other enemies around they and the other team were at risk of being overwhelmed without any speed to cover multiple angles at once like he could. Negotiating his way across the lobby he rounded the far corner, only to find several of the gunmen waiting for him. Leveling their guns, they fired and it was only pure reflex that let him fall into a slide, the grey foam bullets whizzing over his mop of green hair. The slide carried him forward just enough. Idahuo, he charged, and threw a backhanded punch towards the closest minion, catching him in the arm and side. S-M-A-A-S-H. The blow sent him flying. Izuku moved on to the next target, 
jumping and unleashing a roundhouse kick that sent another gunman flying via striking him upside the head. He landed and grabbed hold of a nearby coffee table, lifting the thing one-handed by the leg and using it as a shield, feeling the impact of foam pellets bursting on the other side as he shoved with it. He smashed it against one minion's helmeted head, breaking it with a crack of splintered wood, knocking the last of the gunmen on his ass. He panted, turning and finding three civilians hiding in a corner broom closet. An older couple and what he could only assume was supposed to be their teenage daughter, or perhaps a bystander taking cover with them. Let's go, he yelled, helping the older people up and placing the older man on his back and the older woman in his arms while the young lady stood up. Just follow me and keep your head low. Why yes, thank you. He ran with her around the lobby, seeing the battle unfold as he saw Orca locked in battle against Kakin and Peter. Orca backhanded Kakin who was trying to come in with a blast from behind, sending the blonde skidding across the ground. Peter charged in and decked Orca in the head, stunning him as the American webbed Orca's face and kicked off him. As the whaleman tore the webbing off his face and spat a tooth out of his bloodied lip, he stared them down. Orca didn't seem phased at all. Izuku saw Kakin land, turning about in a pivot with a battle-hungry grin on his features as the blonde oriented himself towards Orca. Izuku finally arrived at the atrium, Shindo wisely coming over to take the old lady off his hands as he set the old man down. The young lady also trotted forward, almost out of breath. Oh, check out Shoto. He's about to fire a big blast at that granny you were scared of, Uncle Might. There was a snort, and the symbol of peace's head whipped around, Aizawa rubbing his mouth. Yaga's impressive eyebrows rose up like a teeter-totter. Focus on the match, Aizawa said quickly. It was Bedlam out there, and all from. One damn old lady. From her foxhole, Intelli stood by with her two classmates as they finished preparing a new batch of tea while the girl relayed orders. She quickly commandeered the services of several mover quirks, two with a semblance of increased speed and a girl with wings named Kanishi. So far, throwing their heavy hitters at Seikaiyo wasn't working. She was anticipating them, sending them all flying back and making it all the harder to land a good hit on her. Any projectiles were dodged with a grace not fitting of a woman her age, or she used any raised debris made from the scarcest of kicks as shields. Todoroki was holding his own, but he was being thrown around as well. The woman seemed almost fixated on him, taunting him the most. As she sipped some warm tea from a paper cup, she felt her mind flex and expand as her IQ increased. Seikaiyo was able to possess the physical power of all might of all people while barely moving a muscle. Her short, controlled motions resembled those of a martial artist. She always maintained her posture, her stance every time that someone came close and only moved when she needed to. She hadn't even moved from her spot save to dodge and bend down with the occasional leap. She took another sip, her brain pumping as she ran over her hypothesis in her head. There was no build-up, no collection of power or even movement for momentum. It was like she wasn't supposed to move to ensure that her quirk would activate. It clicked. Listen up she said, pointing to the three she'd commandeered for this. I need you all to carry the message around. I know how her quirk works and how to beat it. Shoto could already feel both of his sides starting to overextend. With every ice blast, a fire shot needed to go out. Keep things even, keep things moving, all to avoid draining himself. But it was at moments like this that he was actually aware that his fire wasn't on the same level as his ice. Seikaiyo had rarely moved. Many of the students in the arena and the stands were trying to attack her en masse. You're all, Seikaiyo said. Her eyes glued on the dual-haired boy as she positioned her foot towards another piece of earth. So predictable. And the upturned dirt and grass went flying his way. He conjured another massive ice wall, defending from the onslaught and ducking, feeling the pellets fly overhead. He charged his fireside as he surged up what remained of his ice block to prepare a fire blast as he came to the top, only for Seikaiyo to be right in front of him, an amused smirk on her wrinkled face, her open hand outstretched and close to him. Predictable, was she said as she made contact with his gut, a little more motion than usual, and Shoto felt a sledgehammer hit his stomach, sending him flying and skidding across the ground like a stone before coming to a stop. He coughed out parts of his breakfast as he cradled his stomach. He saw the woman out of the corner of his eye stand still and approach only to duck incoming fire from a girl firing her fingernails like a machine gun at her, or a big hulking girl charging with her rhino horn on her nose. Shoto focused on her, doing his best to get oxygen back in his lungs as his eyes were locked on her movements. She simply brought her hand up as the girl approached. Yo, Todoroki, said a voice as Shoto turned as he panted, seeing a rocket girl land close by. Intelli says her quirk is movement. The girl shouted. 
The less she moves, the stronger she is. Shoto blinked. What? But? What? How? The girl cursed. Reaching into her pocket, she fished out her phone before holding it up to him. It was a picture. A picture of a note that he recognized in Telly's handwriting on. Quirk based on stored kinetic force. Less movement equals more stored force. It's why she doesn't move unless necessary. All might light while still, weak while moving. Shoto read the note, the flow of the fight making it ring true as he examined everything that had happened so far. So we make her move, and she can't use her power. Yo Todoroki. He heard a familiar voice as he climbed to his feet, seeing Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu approach at a run. Her quirk, its movement, or rather lack thereof. Shoto shouted as the winged girl took off and the other two boys joined him. She is capable of incredible strength, but it can only be done with the least movement in any body part, like a reversal in kinetic physics of some kind. Yeah, Kendo got word. Tetsu Tetsu said, she says she's got a plan. Shoto nodded okay. Fire and cold erupted from his arms. Let's go. Oh man, I can feel that fighting spirit, Todoroki. Kirishima grinned ear to ear. Let's take her down. Manly style. He charged, Todoroki surging with ice right towards Seikaio. Can you handle fire? Shoto asked. I can. Tetsu Tetsu was in a dead sprint, and Shoto aimed upwards as he made a glacier to push up and over. He turned in midair, releasing a fire stream aimed at the ice mountain he had made, his fire boosting his momentum as he swallowed his left side in an inferno, giving him air as he smothered the Class B metal boy in it. But Tetsu Tetsu was right in the thick of it. The heavier and dug-in metal boy who had bent towards the ground to let the gale winds, Flame and steam pass over. They charged right through the steam, smoke, and debris of it all. Hiroshima reared back for a punch, and a red-hot Tetsu Tetsu did the same, roaring as they charged. Seikaio didn't look phased as she dodged the strikes from the two boys, even as Tetsu Tetsu's smoldering heat made her back away to avoid the burn. No doubt she was trying to use as little movement as possible for her quirk. Seikaio unleashed a slight backhand and sent Kirishima stumbling across the ground. Tetsu Tetsu kept on coming at her, still blazing orange. Now she looked annoyed. She stepped on the ground which burst like an egg, tripping the iron-skinned teen mid-charge. Then, from under the earth behind her something burst out, grabbing onto her. It looked like some kind of straw-made doll. What the hell? Seikaiyo yelled. The doll's legs wrapped around her legs like a snake, keeping them separate, and her arms kept her target's arms out of position as she moved, puppeteering the enraged old woman. At a girl Nijima, Hiroshima yelled. No doll will dot 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 stop me, Seikaiyo uttered, writhing as the girl kept doing full motions, forcing her arms in constant motion. She turned about, walking and facing away as Shoto could see Nijima's determined smirk. You're right, but she can. Shoto barely made out the girl's retort as she let go. The woman's limbs and her body were wide open. The old woman stumbling forward towards the crater Nijima had burst out of, and the ground under her erupted again, a massive fist exploding outward. It collided with Seikaiyo's jaw. Her head whipping back as Kendo Itsuka roared out with her enlarged hand, the red head being pushed up by some mole person. With a battle cry, Kendo then reared back her unused left hand and grabbed onto the villain, her limbs in her fingers as she came down with a ground-pounding blow, the old woman's face catching the brunt of the blow. Down you go, Kendo yelled out, subduing the villain. Practical exam section, school attack. Complete. Villain group, Hateful Eight. Captured and neutralized, said the electronic voice over the loudspeakers as cheers began to break out. Saitama Kayuka flexed and stretched her neck, looking back at those kids as they marched out. They came in far more bloated numbers than anticipated, which gave her the green light from that sleepy-eyed dog and Mira to not hold back one bit. You knew my old man. Seikaiyo turned, seeing Todoroki turn as he finished his talk with Kendo, the girl looking her way as well. You mentioned him quite a bit. Yes, Todoroki Inji was a former pupil of mine. The old woman replied, the villainous nature gone as she stretched her arms a little. Came to me for training here and there when he was a bit older than you. Truth be told I was enjoying retirement quite a bit until I saw you at the sports festival last April. She smiled lightly. You are making greater strides now than your father ever was. She turned towards the other kids as they approached. Keep getting stronger in your own way. I plan to. Todoroki nodded. But, my goal is not to become my father. My dream is, become stronger than him. Seikaiyo mused, turning and cocking an eyebrow. That was a typical young in response and all. Maybe. I don't know. I thought as much but right now. Right now I. He paused, looking to the side, seeming a little unsure. To be fair, most youngsters were unsure these days. He didn't possess that blazing determination she saw in Todoroki and G40 some odd years ago. 
She smiled lightly. Well, I may not be around to see it but, if I do, I am curious to see what your dream will bring, young pup. She turned towards the redhead. You there, what's your name? Kendo Itsuka ma'am. The girl replied. Seikaiyo looked her over, up and down. Keep up the good form and keep your mind sharp. I'm going to be feeling that uppercut for a week. She smirked before she turned around, walking towards the JSDF Navy SEALs she was working with as they were bantering and laughing. No doubt going through their experience against these future heroes. It was fun stretching the old one-inch blow. Working with that quirk made her quite the hero back in the day. When she tried to match up to that stupidly curvy minx Shimura and that hunk of a man in Gran Torino. Why did he keep sticking with her anyway? All she did was fly. She couldn't cause the seas to part like Moses with a flick like she could. Wonder how all Torino is doing these days. The grey pink haired woman mused aloud as she continued to stretch as she walked, pulling arms and Urkk, and she felt a bone creak and she winced. Aw oh, there it is. She rubbed her back. I wonder how Inji-kun is doing. Take the eyes. Achako came down with a yell, hand on her light as a feather plank of wood as she charged, bashing it across in Dev and Tay. It's in Tay. In Tay's head. The man didn't stagger or stumble. There was even some shock, his psychic Bernie Lady Suzaku turning with a wide-eyed look, along with several of her teammates. One second, two seconds, three, and Achako felt her stomach turn to heavy lead as she saw the man on fire turn, eye and lip twitching and blood dripping from his crown as he recognized her. His eyes seemed to burn even hotter as the burnet felt the temperature rise in the room. Hugh, Endeavor snarled, and she wasn't aware that his eyeballs could light on fire. That was absolutely terrifying. Eh, 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 she laughed nervously. A part of her wanted to say sorry. The bigger part of her wanted to run. She listened to that bigger part of her. Um, um sir. Kamiji Mo turned towards her boss as they took on the roles of vice boss and boss of the Intei Yakuza for the provisional license examination for the HPSC. Shouldn't we handle the rest of these heroes? We do need to set the building on fire for the insurance and she hit me with a plank. Endeavor growled, and he took off like a bullet, somehow even faster thanks to Uravity's quirk. Get back here, girl. Somebody help me. Came the girl's wail as Mo sighed in sympathy. No one needed to be on Endeavor's bad list for the day. Did he have a history with the round-faced girl? Welp. Mo turned, and Burnin smirked as her green hair spotted the enemy heroes now focusing back on her after seeing that display. All right then, heroes. Try and stop me if you can. Her hands turned to emerald flame, and she charged into the fray. A horned girl with bright yet determined blue eyes and blonde hair stared her down and charged, standing on two horns with three others floating beside her surging forth. Oh playing chicken, bring it on, foolish children, Genus muttered, and with a tug of his arm, he brought the entire cavalcade of youths with him like how one would pull clothing bound together from a washing machine. Boys and girls yelling in surprise as they were tugged out, like links in a chain. That fast, this is, the number four hero, Setsuna thought, fear in the awaiting doom of failure looming down on her. Parts of Genus' denim attire along his sleeves were gone, but the threads were growing tight all around them, and they were all trapped. Now, die with the bureaucracy that holds our country do ug. Genus' monologue was cut short, and the man was frozen, eyes wide as he seemed unable to move. Best G Trimmer, who had the door open, turned his head. Don't look towards me. Stick in the canister. Gina stuttered, his entire body stiff and his eye wide. In the vent. These heroes dot 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 have a paralysis quirk. Hell, not bad, snake face. The gorilla boy uttered. It's Habuko. The lizard girl uttered. Can't blink Kaminari, you in position. You bet I am. Kaminari, who was bound but had his arms outstretched with his fingers aimed at. Some unique gear on his hands too. How about this? One million volt stream. He yelled, and from the gloves he possessed, a bolt of electricity raced out and struck Genus. Genus was blasted with electricity, the man shaking as he fell to his knees, his denim cinched. Ha, huh, idiots, with Genus between me and you. Trimmer yelled in front of the ventilation shaft, one large enough for that canister to be placed in and activated. You can't hope to get me. No, nah. Kaminari's voice held a smirking edge. Just needed to distract you for a second. Before the villain could ask, there was a massive crash. Trimmer turned, and immediately dropped the canister and brought his hands up to defend himself. As a giant water dragon burst through, with Yeyurazu riding on it, a paintball rifle was held up in her hand like some action movie star, and Takoyami was right behind her with dark shadow conjured and pinning him. Light him up, the dark monster shouted. Satsuna mentally cheered as Trimmer was slammed into the wall by Rivu, and Momo landed on her feet, pelting the minion with paintball pellets galore. Satsuna couldn't see from her angle, but the shouts of pain and anger made the greenette feel good deep down. 
and there was a sudden shout of pain from Habuko, Setsuna unable to turn around to see why. But it must have been the linen genist had under control affecting her sight, making her unable to look at him. The man turned around, and both arms were outstretched as the denim from his costume sleeves remained on the kids who came up with Gorilla Kid, Habuko, and Kaminari. The denim from his leggings lashed out towards the other end of the hall, and got Tsunami, Yeyurazu, and Takoyami. What the devil? Takoyami shouted. Sleeves and shirts may be my proficiency when it comes to manipulating clothing and fabric, but I can assure you. Every piece of linen upon my person, Genus spouted, and upon my foe is my weapon. He clenched his fingers, and Satsuna yelped, feeling the yarn tighten around her. She could hear the groans and cries of discomfort from the ones behind her. Te Kaminari, Satsuna shouted. Can't dot 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 my hands they're jammed. I'd get all of you. Gionananjih, do it. Gorilla shouted, as a few others agreed. We can take it. I am not going to fail. Not no way, not no how. Why you sure? Don't. Habuko shouted. There's civilians. In this room. Satsuna panicked, and she heard a gasp from the other end as she turned as best she could. It was Yeyarazu. She must have been surprised that some civilians hadn't been evacuated yet. A pity. Genus spouted as he walked calmly towards the end of the hall, keeping a bound Takoyami in dark shadow pinned to the ceiling near the lamp and Rivu against the wall with Momo at an awkward angle. Setsuna felt that pit of despair slowly return. Damn it. They even got the drop on him. But, sadly, heroes. He said as he got to the door, his eyes looking down the hall and focusing the attention on the heroes. I win. He opened it wider and, a floating fire extinguisher. It came down, with a girlish hia. The extinguisher clocked Genus right in the head. Hard. A collective. Duo. Spoke out from the crowd. What the? Setsuna uttered as Genus stood, and stood, and fell right on his back. A large welt on his crown and his eyes rolled back. Immediately, all of the linens became loose, and the students let out a sigh of relief. Takoyami fell and landed on his feet. Ribu transformed back into her human state and Momo landed on her feet. The fire extinguisher was still floating over Genus. Hagakure. Hagakure beat best Genus. Setsuna felt a little faint. Does that mean we win? Practical exam section. Government building assault. Complete. Villain group. Ghosts of Kyoto. Captured and neutralized. Peter's world rattled when his body hit the wall, leaving the lobby as he broke through and entered a break room. Back room of sorts in the convention center. He barely got a second to breathe right before the living tank that was gang orca smashed through it like a runaway train in an attempt to grab the sparking green blur that was Izuku. With one hand, he forced the boy to dodge, but his other hand was already in motion. Izuku wordlessly gasped as Orca's fist drove the air out of his lungs. It didn't matter how fast Izuku was comparatively, Orca had more combat experience in a week than most students had seen in their lifetime. They weren't the first quickly moving fighters that he's ever had to battle, and despite that, he was still here. So the attack hit with Izuku being knocked back, and Orca almost lazily put up an arm to block the series of explosions that came down from Bakugo, but his eyes shifted over to Peter instantly. The body was barely in the air from his attack before Orca simply leaned backwards, letting one of the blasts go wide. Peter's eyes widened, and he had to spin in midair to avoid the fire. He looked back at his opponent, or the fist of his opponent. Peter's head snapped to the side with the blow, and he hit the ground hard. A warkri split the air, only to be cut off as Orca's hand grasped over Ella's mouth. The next instant, he was bringing his hand down, Hard. Elle's eyes shot open, but with Orca's hand over her mouth, she couldn't even scream in pain. Just then, the room lit up with explosions that looked like they'd been shot out of a machine gun, peppering Orca's back. The larger villain turned, which was when Peter struck. The teen's leg hit the villain's wrist, knocking his grip loose and letting him grab Elle before jumping away. He set her down only a few steps away behind a wall, while Orca dealt with a series of explosions that seemed to at least be blinding him for a moment. I'd say he's built like a tank, but honestly that's disrespectful to the gains that man has. He mused. Then rush him. Elle screamed. A thought that sounded good but Orca's hand grasped a rock. He threw it like a baseball pitcher, smashing through a wall with the force alone. It was a small moment of respite, one that two students took full advantage of. As one, Spider-Man and Deku's fists lashed out. Both hit the raised fists of Orca as minor shockwaves erupted from their blows. The Whale Man retaliated with a series of quick blows that could have turned stone to dust. But Peter and Izuku dodged and counterattacked as Orca either took the hits or brushed them aside. This dude was made of friggin' lead. Peter latched himself to the ceiling, rolling along the tile to avoid an upward strike that tore through the concrete. Izuku leapt back, a series of rocks in his hand. They flew out like a machine gun, 
not damaging Orca, but throwing the dust of the concrete into the villain's eyes. For a single second, Orca was staggered. Peter dropped from the ceiling, his foot coming down like an axe on the villain's head to finish it. Remembering Mirko's kicks during their sparring session, as if on instinct, Peter completed the axe kick, the motion looking like a crescent moon, staggering Orca as the blow made him buckle at the knee and went down to it as Peter followed through, the ground cratering under Orca. The villain's eyes snapped towards him before Peter's sense screamed at him. Shit. Got you. Then, everything was sound. The sonic blast hit point blank, and Peter didn't even feel himself hit the ground. He was screaming in his own suit, his hands on his ears, only the vague vibrations telling him what was going on. Then, a jerking sensation, and a small blast of heat before a sudden stop. Did he hit a wall? Did someone throw him aside? He didn't know, he couldn't hear anything, he couldn't even see anything. He grit his teeth. He needed to get up, he needed to help. But he couldn't, so he laid on the ground, trying to get up. His arms and legs felt like jelly. God, was this what being a newborn horse felt like? Peter shook his head, trying to force his eyes to focus. The hut on his suit was working overtime, and he saw L holding him. Retreat for now. Thanks, Peter tried to utter in English as his entire body was on fire, and it probably sounded more like a groan. L's head tilted, and Peter felt gravity take him. He nearly hit the floor face first, only being stopped by a quick hand. Though, he still hit the floor through his hand, so not the best result. Oh, L, for her part, didn't really care as she charged forwards to the battle. Orca stood in a maelstrom, Izuku weaving in and out for quick hits, roaring all the while as lightning arced around him. Bakugo peppered the villain from a distance with explosions, roaring with Izuku as well. L jumped right in, ducking just under a backhanded swing from Orca, throwing a fist towards his face. A fist where bones jutted out of the skin, sharp singular points going straight for Orca's eye. Peter could see his eyes widen, but his other fist hit her dead on the chest. She skipped once, then flipped, and charged again, howling like an animal, bladed bones coming from her knuckles now. Orca roared in frustration at the thundering strikes from Izuku's jackhammer-like blows, the slashes of L at his legs causing him to fall to his knees and Bakugo aimed his gauntlet. Move it Deku, bones. He barked, and the two jumped as Orca roared. The pin was pulled, and Bakugo fired as Orca's sonar blast went off. Fire and fury raced out to meet the invisible shockwave as both passed through each other, sound versus a literal explosion. Orca was sent flying, skidding across the ground and slamming into the wall which caused a massive indent. Bakugo staggered on his feet, Izuku going to his side and supporting him as he fell to his knees, although the boy pushed him off as if he had leprosy. You want win? Orca bellowed, and Peter turned, seeing Orca land on his feet and hands after he had staggered out, his coat falling to the ground, his red eyes wide, sharp teeth exposed. This society will change, and it will change in fire. Damn, he's doing a hell of a job selling the villain act. Shoji's ears were screaming at him from every direction. The fight with Orca was destroying the building like children knocking down sandcastles, and his own situation was barely any better. The villain minions weren't strong, but there were a lot of them. As if to emphasize his point a globule of pinkish foam splattered across the edge of the corner he was using as cover and he could hear more of them moving into position under their allies covering fire. Shizaki arrived, but he could see several strands of her hair getting clumped and stuck together by the now hardened cement like foam coating them. The civilians are finally clear. She shouted. Shoji nodded. Good. One less problem. Now all they had to do was beat the villains. We're really running the clock here. We may not have time to disarm the bomb. What do we do? Shindo yelled. The multi-armed boy bit down a curse. Right? The bomb. I have a plan. Shizaki said, and Shoji turned, as did everyone else. What is it? He inquired and the girl smirked lightly. My classmate Tsunotori passed our final of bomb disposal by carrying it away using her horns. I will attempt the same, but I will need time. She had a suitcase bomb. That bomb is attached to that vehicle however. He heard yelling and saw El skid across the ground before getting up with grit teeth and sheer spite, her eyes flashing. A fresh volley of fire forced them all to duck back into cover. Shizaki looked at him. If much more of my quirk gets tangled up I won't be able to get rid of the bomb. He nodded. You all heard her. He shouted. We're punching through them and getting her to that tank. Right on. Shindo gave him a thumbs up. Let's kick their asses. Utsushimi, stay back, make a glamour cloud to give us cover and make illusionary clones. Can do. The air-headed blonde brought her hands to her lips, blowing out another kiss. More rainbow-like mist escaped, forming around them and expanding as mirage-like doppelgangers of Mizo, and his teammates appeared. The multi-armed boy ran first, the army of clones all around him, Shindo, Utsushimi, Shizaki and Monoma. 
They bolted across the lobby under the cover of Shizaki's vines and Utsushimi's illusions, bypassing the battle against Orca entirely as they charged the soldiers. He expanded his arms as far as they would reach, using them as large, fin-like shields, providing cover to the others behind him. The clones began to dissipate, little more than dust and sound but it was enough. He slammed into the first group of men like a rampaging train, arms lashing out, cracking helmets and sending grown men flying. Shizaki's vines darted around him, slapping away rifles and tripping soldiers as they tried to line up a shot. Shindo and Monoma's quakes sent whole walls of jagged stone up as obstacles and shields, cutting off enemies from their sightlines and covering positions as Shoji rushed with Ibarra towards the tank. Approaching the tank, Shoji heard the danger before he saw it, giving him enough warning to dive into cover as a line of soldiers emerged from the rubble in a crude firing line, laying down a volley of faux bullets and pink foam that caught Monoma with a startled scream. He went down before Shindo could quake another wall into existence to shield them. The drill tank started to move, its motor roaring as caterpillar treads adjusted its position providing a mobile cover platform for the soldiers to advance. Mizo's ear twitched, and he heard the crunch of something coming closer. The muzzle of a gun came around the side of his cover, the soldier trying to flush him out. The white-haired boy's hand snapped up, grabbing hold of the gun and squeezing it for all he was worth. The metal crumpled in his hand, and the bullet that was about to be fired jammed in the barrel. Surprise let Mizo rip the gun out of his enemy's hand and use it like a baseball bat. It cracked against his head, throwing him down, and in the same moment, he turned and threw it. Metal cracked against the metal of a helmet belonging to another armored minion that dared to come around to his position. Another ground quake and this time, when Shoji heard the rocks spear out of the ground they were accompanied by the sound of rending metal and groaning steel. Men screamed, and he dared a look around the cover he was standing behind to see a lance of obsidian goring the tank like a boar. Its drill pointed up, and its caterpillar tread spun uselessly as it was hoisted off the ground to the point of nearly tipping sideways. Rush them now, he shouted. He didn't care if he was heard, he wasn't even sure how many of his own teammates could follow up on his orders. All he knew was that this was probably their best chance. He charged in, leaping across rubble and debris to close the distance as the men tried to find their feet. Then he was on top of them. His arms were moving again, rapid-fire punches taking down six men before he had to grab one and use him as a shield. Vines slammed into a cordon of people across the firing line and more ground quakes opened up fissures and crags in the earth that sent men reeling. Nizo heard a call, and his head snapped towards the tank. The men were regrouping, focusing their foam guns and stun guns now that their men were no longer in the friendly fire zone. The tall boy tensed, ready to move, only for vines to appear in front of him. They were shredded in the stun bullet hailstorm, but they were stopped, just barely enough. Mizo moved back behind cover as Shizaki moved her arms. Repent, she said, cold enough that even the white-haired boy felt a shiver down his spine. Before he could even ask what she was doing, he heard the screams. Shizaki's vines came down like tentacles, wrapping around the remaining men. Their guns were ripped out of their hands, and the men were pulled up into the air, dangling and yelling before she threw them all aside in different directions. Shoji didn't even take a second to congratulate his classmate. The bomb, he shouted, rushing to get to the tank's top hatch. Who knew how much longer they had? He had an eye glance towards Orca. He was being assailed on all sides with Midoriya and L up close. Parker fired web bullets at a distance but he was limping, and Bakugo was going back and forth. They were applying pressure, holding him. Before he made it though, Shizaki's vines snagged him, holding him back. Don't concern yourself, she said. I've got it. He was confused, but only for a moment. Vines moved from the men she'd incapacitated to the tank itself, coiling around the large transport vehicle like serpents. Shoji's eyes widened, hearing the metal groaning under a steady, crushing pressure. Like a tin can it actually began to buckle, bolts and divots breaking off like bullets, more of Shizaki's vines taking hold of the machine and crumpling it like a can. Then, it started sinking. Shoji didn't feel the ground shaking beneath him, but rather saw more vines travel into the breach, literally splitting the earth under the behemoth transport and pulling the thing underground. Like a massive, chewing maw the vines crumpled the metal and forced it downward with a steel groaning crunch, other vines shoving debris and earth on top of it. In 30 seconds it was buried, or crushed, or both. Shoji made a mental note that if Shizaki was ever mad, don't bother looking for a body. Practical exam section, building assault, complete, villain objective, bombing, unsuccessful, civilian status, evacuated, said a robotic voice. Shoji Mizo heard that, and for the life of him, he just let his head fall back. It was done, well done, said a rather deep voice as Izuku turned. 
Orca was brushing off some debris as he turned towards the heroes. He had lost his cape. His suit was in tatters and there were some visible bruises on his body, but otherwise he sounded fine. You managed quite well given the circumstances, the whale hero mused as some of the minions who were pinned or lying prone rose back to their feet. Izuku also saw medical robots emerging to treat any injuries. Will your men be okay Mr. Orca? Izuku inquired as Orca turned, his red eyes no longer filled with rage but a calm stoicism. They're getting hazard pay and they were all aware of what they were signing up for. The number 10 ranked hero said as he turned, as did Izuku. Kaken had his hands on his knees while keeping his head raised, legs shaking and covered in sweat as Orca walked over to him, picking up his coat along the way. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a water bottle that was able to survive through all of that. Here, he offered it to him. Drink up. Kaken scowled miserably as he took the offered bottle and started chugging. The pro hero took a second before marching off. Izuku got up to his feet and walked over. We did great Kaken. He said lightly, finally able to relax. You were incredible back there. I didn't beat him though. He growled, crushing the now empty bottle in his hands. But we stopped him didn't we? Izuku flinched as he felt the boy's glare. And we saved all the civilians too. I think All Might would consider that a win, right? HNM. He scoffed, looking away. Whatever you say nerd. He sulked off, and Izuku felt unsure as he watched his friends back. We passed, didn't we? Kami asked as she sauntered up. Like, wonder why he's being so down about it. She then beamed as she saw Izuku. You were, like, super cool. Going in and out of my glamour clouds and bustin' heads. That was totes crazy in there. The boy blushed, freezing up on the spot as the girl approached. Indeed. Without your help, we would have been overrun. Shoji replied as he joined them, one of his arm mouths smiling at the group. You and L were crucial. Um, Yael acknowledged, blushing under the praise. It was a hard choice to juggle between dealing with the minions or helping Parker and Kaken against Orca. Oh really? We could have handled it fine. Called Monoma as he approached with his tuxedo sleeves in shambles. Not that he seemed to care. Besides, I would have been able to take more of those goons than you class A. Monoma, enough. Shizaki replied as she turned, giving the blonde boy a stare with her vines raised like snakes. I apologize for my tardiness. I'll need to improve my indoor speed using my vines. I will admit, I neglected that area of my quirk over the camp. Hey Ibarra, don't sweat it. Izuku turned, seeing Peter join the group with a smile on his face. He gave a thumbs up her way. Counts as a win in my book. He sat down on a piece of debris and took a deep breath. Jeez, I still feel parts of me ringing. From that shockwave you took, Izuku inquired. Just gotta move a bit. Kinda like trying to recover from parts of your body falling asleep. Peter said as he wiggled his toes in his shoes. Still, I'm glad we were able to pass this. Not yet. L replied as she was being supported by Shindo, her arm over his shoulders. Still gotta be graded. Oh right, the point system. Izuku muttered, his anxiety starting to flare up again. All applicants who have completed their exams, please look to the scoreboard within your assigned stadium. Your point totals will be displayed there. Boomed a robotic voice as everyone looked up. The scoreboard is outside, Shoji said as he began to walk through the ruined battlefield that was the convention center lobby. Let's go. They arrived outside, gazing up at the scoreboard hanging above as they made it to an angle to better see it. It flickered on. Punida, Tynan my number. El cursed, looking away. Shindo gave her an assuring pat on the shoulder. What did she say? Peter whispered as Izuku turned, shrugging as he looked for his own score. Team White 4. Bakugo Katsuki 47 points. Laura Logan 69 points. Midoriya Izuku 74 points. Monoma Nito 38 points. Peter Parker 58 points. Shizaki Ibarra 81 points. Shindo Yo 73 points. Shoji Mizo 87 points. Atsushimi Kami 56 points. Complete 89% pass. A cute All Might face with a thumbs up was displayed at the end as Izuku gave out a big smile. Relief and accomplishment filling his chest while he struggled not to start crying. Most of us passed. Shoji sighed in relief as Shindo gave out a whooping cry, drowning out the angry sputtering of Monoma. How did I? The blonde blabbered out, jaw going up and down. We did it L. High five. Shindo said, turning towards L, or Laura as it was, her face as sour as curdled milk. She didn't return the gesture that the black-haired boy was giving her. So like, why go by L? Kami asked before she blinked. Oh it's cause of that's the first letter of your first and last names. L and L. I totes get it now. Not a fan of my family back home. Okay. Laura growled as she looked away. Shindo smiled, his arm going back down. Hey it's okay L, nothing to worry about here. He looked back to the rest of the group. Gotta say, I was pretty nervous for a moment there, back when we first met up. But I was glad to have worked with you all. 
he said as he offered handshakes. Don't mind Elle as well, I kinda know how she ticks, her being my classmate and all. The brunette glared his way lightly, though he didn't seem bothered. Likewise, thanks for providing a great defense for us, Shoji replied as he shook it in kind. Yeah, without your vibrate quirk causing so much debris to shield the stairs and stagger those minions, we would have had big time trouble. Izuku replied, happily shaking the offered hand. Shindo beamed, rubbing the back of his head. Hello, like, am I chopped liver or something? Yeah. Kami tilted her head. Like, his raised earth and all those quakes only were totes effective thanks to my glamour making them all totally confused. She beamed Shindo's way, approaching as the teen boy blinked. Like, we should all totally be besties and share contacts and a light growl was heard, and Elle was glaring at her while standing beside Shindo. Oh, did you want mine too? Shindo laughed lightly, trying to keep his angry classmate from starting something. Aw shucks, it's fine. I just did my job is all. You were great too Utsushimi. Still, wonder why I only got a 73. He mused, taking his tag from his pocket and looking at it as a holographic screen emerged, displaying his grading. Oh, that's why. Oh yeah, I should check mine too. Izuku said as he reached into his pocket, turning and seeing Peter approach. You doing okay? He asked, seeing Peter's suit. It was a little ragged and dusted up, sporting some tears and cuts. You did take quite the pounding from Orca. Do you need to see the doctors? Shoji inquired. I'll be fine. Peter stretched his arms a bit. Nothing a day at the support department and walking off the numbness of that sonar blast won't fix. He wiggled his foot a little. Team White 4 blared a robotic voice as everyone turned, seeing a cleanup robot roll up to them as many others began to sweep up and push the debris into piles. Please leave the examination grounds. We must perform our duty. Oh right. Eh sorry. Izuku chirped, pocketing his tag as everyone else began to leave. Come on, we can check out our scores back on the concourse. Agreed. Shoji said. Let's go. Yep. Peter placed his own tag back on his shoulder as Izuku looked his way, seeing him put his mask on. His eyes were narrowed as he rubbed the bridge of his forehead. His one visible eye closed. Damn it. That score. He muttered in English, enough for Izuku to hear. See what your score was about. Izuku asked. Yeah. He muttered, his eye looking towards the still silent Bakugo and glaring lightly before he sighed. Still, we passed. Can't complain. Yeah, don't worry about that. Let's not fret on that stuff anyway. Shindo added. Seven out of eight passed. I'll take that as a win. He looked back, the pale and mumbling Monoma still staring angrily at his tag. Needs, babysitting, Monoma said aloud, aghast. Shizaki rolled her eyes as Izuku winced a little. Monoma was very rough to handle. Without Shizaki, research would have been difficult, working with the malcontent, if not impossible with him egging on Bakugo and Peter's feud. Still, a part of Izuku did feel bad. He contributed a good deal in helping the civilians. Let's go Monoma. You shouldn't cause more trouble than you have already. She muttered. I hope you will take this as a lesson moving forward. Her tone softened a little, trying to offer some comfort to her classmate. The boy's jaw locked shut as he stood up straight, sighing deeply. Vlad Sensei is gonna kill me. He muttered lightly and the two followed after the students, save for Izuku who had stopped, seeing Kaken still staring at the board. Tekken, Katsuki turned, and fucking Deku was standing there looking worried like a fucking idiot. A far cry from minutes ago when he was focused and looked like he had a goddamn spine. You doing okay? Katsuki let out a sound between tightly clenched teeth, his hand reaching to his tag as robots went about their business. You got hit a few times from Orca so, if you want we can check out the infirmary together and... Shut the fuck up. He bit out, pausing and looking to the side with a sigh. I'll go get checked. He added, though lacking his usual aggressive air. He was pissed off, but he was always pissed off and he had to remind himself that, as much as infuriating as he was, Deku wasn't the one he should be pissed off with. Deku flinched, and Katsuki had to bite down the snarl and the shout of frustrated anger behind tightly clenched teeth. When the fuck did this shit get so goddamn complicated? He was Deku and his bullshit shouldn't matter, but it did because the part of Bakugo who knew he'd messed up, the part that knew he'd fucked this up enough already, told him it should. Well, okay then. I'll tell Aizawa sensei you're getting checked out. I'll see you at the hotel to collect our stuff. He trotted off, and Katsuki turned his attention away from the mixed bag of complicated bullshit that was Deku, and held out his tag, clicking the button on the side as the screen came forth. The words stuck out to him in bright red letters. Extreme uncooperativeness. Aggressively and negatively assertive. Ill attitude and manner befitting for an agency hero. Threatening a teammate during research. Friendly fire upon teammate in heat of action. He was in the fucking way. 
and his precog Yukun's Katsuki grit out through his teeth, wanting to blast the device to kingdom come if it wasn't the reason for him to get his license. He got his hero provisional license. He got his fucking license because of a point mulligan. He would have failed if the other extras had actually been fucking competent. You look defeated, back you go. A voice came and Katsuki turned. Gang Orca was walking through the debris, his large lumbering steps sending light tremors through the ground with every step. Katsuki looked at the giant of a man, his lip curling into a sneer just begging to bloom across his face. Maybe it was his internship with the man. Maybe he was pissed off, or maybe he just wanted to actually talk. For whatever reason, the words slipped out of him. I should have failed. Come, 47. He bit out. This test I failed this, Orca. Yet you didn't. If we were at full strength and if those extras had come. Katsuki growled, struggling to get his actual thoughts out. I would have lost. Again to those two and I couldn't beat you and. You're doing this again. Orca sighed, his large black and white hand caressing his temple as Katsuki noticed a light discoloration there. Bruising no doubt. He could see plenty of light burns and scrapes along his arms and neck too, to say nothing of the state of his suit. You really need to stop focusing on surpassing others as the be-all end all. I thought you understood that, when that girl embraced you that day. Katsuki flinched, remembering the look of adulation in her eyes, the way she hugged him and admired him. But I, you got the lowest of the passing scores, that is true. Your teamwork needs work, badly. But Orca rolled his neck. Being bad at something and acknowledging it is the first step to becoming good at something. I noticed in your fight against me that you didn't work well with him. The American boy. Tatsuki didn't reply, looking away. I understand. There are people in the hero industry I don't like working with either, and they may not like me in turn. However, you need to be able to put all that aside. The blonde's eyes turned, and his red met Orca's. Because if this was a real scenario, one which you have been in, lives would have been on the line. Life and death. He narrowed his gaze. And why am I getting this? Katsuki growled. Don't see him being told. He is not in front of me. Orca interrupted. And do you wish for him to improve? Or for you to improve? That question made the blonde bomber's mouth snap shut. Orca's large hand reached over, tapping the tag. I would hope this wouldn't matter, but if it does, I'm not above using that either. You want this score to be better than stop complaining about how it is and start beating the score. What Parker does or does not do is irrelevant. It's about what you do, and whether you're willing to accept your flaws and learn from them. Katsuki looked away. I can never forgive him, you know that. He muttered, hands clenched. I don't give a shit if I have to work with Deku or whoever but he. Humiliated me. He uttered, tongue tasting like ash as his eyes shifted to the ground, memories of the past forever burned into his head. I'm not saying you forgive him. I'm saying that you shelve it and act like an adult. Worker rumbled, frowning and eyes soft. You're taking this hard because it means so much to you. If half the heroes in this country had your passion, we would be a safer society I say. Katuski felt something in his chest. I hope you can understand and grow from this, Bakugo. Worker's grip tightened further. I know you can. He walked off and Katsuki looked at his tag, looking at the words in green that caught his eye. Excellent combat skills. Excellent research. Saving comrades and civilians under live fire. Towards the end, teamwork in need of improvement, but average. He stuffed the tag into his pocket and marched out of the arena, still angry but gaining a new perspective perhaps. Shoto sat on a bench. The horde of students in front of him choked the hallways, each one standing in front of the monitor, eagerly awaiting to see who passed and who failed. It had gotten so bad that the proctors had to shout several times that there was no need to find the scoreboard, that their own personal scores would be displayed on their tags. 65 points. 65 points needed to pass, and he'd basically torched half the points for this exam. He took a deep breath through his nose, holding and slowly releasing it. By and large at this point, he was resigned to failure. Going over everything in his head, the most he could attribute to himself was 60 points. Even that deduction was marginal and wholly dependent on how many other teams had managed to pass their exams in spite of the failures of his own team. Suddenly, he felt the tag over his chest vibrate, and Shoto shut his eyes taking another deep breath before looking down. 65. He stared, blinking at the tag and the number displayed on it with what was, frankly, blank incomprehension. He flipped the tag over. The five was now backwards but it certainly reflected the number he should be seeing here. He held his breath, staring at the tag for a while longer. The words stuck out to him in red. Negatively assertive. Disregard for working with others. Minimal leadership capabilities. Failure to research deeper meaning of red herrings. Then the words in green. Excellent combat skills against dangerous villain. Astute research with selected teammates. Positive trend of teamwork in battle. Keeping collateral damage to a minimum given nature of quirk. 
Note, while Todoroki Shoto has great control of his quirk, there is more to being a hero than destructive control and assertiveness. Observers note his desire to go forwards and continue pushing. While ambitious is not conducive to a team environment but the drive to improve is there and can be cultivated. Looking over those words a few more times, he let out a puff of air that was almost a wheeze, not quite a laugh but not wholly relief either, more like sheer disbelief being expelled with everything else. He'd passed, by the margins, with absolutely no points to spare. But he passed, Shoto shut his eyes, hands coming up to rest his forehead against them almost like a prayer, with his tag hanging between his nearly slack fingers. Slowly he let the breath leave his lungs. He wasn't sure how long he sat there before he got to his feet. The pounding of his heart was sending blood throbbing across his skull and making his head ache something fierce now. Even so, he moved to seek out his UA classmates. There were a lot of tags in red, indicating a failure. They outnumbered the greens by what he suspected at a simple glance to be a significant margin, and most of those greens were certainly not from his agency. He spied Intelli across the room with several of her girls now clustered around her. A pleased smile decorated her face, green tag now firmly in her hands. She caught his eye, smirking as she held up the sign of her unexpected victory. He did the same, nodding once before he saw her return to her conversation. He kept walking. Hiroshima and Tetsutetsu let out a whoop of joy, so loud he couldn't help but find them near the front of the crowd. The stone and steel quirk users were grinning with sharpened fangs and pumped fists. They hadn't been part of his agency but it was good for them. Finally, he spotted Kendo Itsuka. Kendo-san. He called, offering a possible congratulations. She turned at his voice, offering a small grin, one which quickly fell as her eyes trailed down. He went still. Her tag was red. Shoto's eyes widened, and what must have been the dumbest question he'd ever spouted in his whole life tumbled out of his mouth before he could stop it. Whose tag is that? She looked at him, and then spotted his green tag resting in his now tightly clenched fist, her face souring. Mine, she stated, her voice sounding completely flat and defeated, a far cry from her usual fire. Shoto shook his head. That's impossible. This has to be a mistake. Out of any of them, out of all of them Kendo was the one who he believed deserved to pass. She'd been the one to pull even a semblance of a plan together. Hell she'd been advocating exactly for what the goal of the test was from the very inception. She even got the finishing blow that took down Seikaiowo. They must have known that, and if they didn't he was gonna make sure someone knew that. No mistake. She mumbled, shrugging, acting as though she'd already accepted the results. Shoto bared his teeth in a snarl, an uncharacteristic anger building in his chest like a flame. It is. If I passed then so did you. You. She looked at him, and the look was enough to make the words die in his throat even before she spoke. Her eyes were wrought with a storm of pain and anger. It's not a mistake. She held up her tag. 64 displayed bright and clear. Lack of assertiveness. Failure to correct teammates when they were heading down the wrong path. Several civilians shot in vicinity. Shoto's mouth was open while Kendo continued to speak, her self-deprecation hanging on every word. I'm a nobody. Hard to look at when it's someone like me. She shrugged, scoffing as she gave him a light glare. But I think someone up top can dig up an extra point or two for the son of Endeavor rather than some girl with big hands. The building flame in his chest suddenly turned cold, his eyes wide and mouth agog. Kendo winced. She gave another shrug, pained and torn, the hand falling to her side as she let out a sigh that sounded tired. Or perhaps defeated. I'm sorry, she said, that's unfair. He watched her turn and walk away arms rising to hug herself. K. Kendo wait. I, I'll see you around, Todoroki. She walked away, hands gripping her arms as she tried to avoid shedding a tear. Shoto stood there, still as a statue as the throng of students began to brush past him. The dual-haired boy could feel their glares upon him as he looked down. His fists clenched and for the first time in his memory, Shoto felt like he could have burned the whole of the stadium down. I can't believe I passed. Hagakure gushed, her license floating in midair. This is so awesome. I'm a legit pro now, provisional, Kaminari added, though not taking his eyes off his own license. But I get what you mean. This rocks. We have taken one step forward into the unknown, Takoyami muttered as he walked beside Momo. One that will make us into better heroes. Heh, I'm gonna miss your little broodingisms, Rivu said, petting Takoyami on the head as the bird-headed boy growled. It's been a fun few days. She turned towards Momo and gave a toothy grin. You take good care of my little birdie, okay? I am not your bird. He growled out, a light blush managing to break through his feathered face. Awa, is that some pink I see on your cheeks? Kaminari oiled, grinning widely. Someone likes being pampered Hagakure added, and Momo had to stifle her giggling. Be silent. I am not someone to be looked at as some doting sign of affection. 
Takoyami barked. But I am. Dark shadow burst out of his cloak all of a sudden as Takoyami sputtered, the creature embracing Rivu. Pet me pet me. I'm gonna miss Yawu. All while miss you too shadow chan. Rivu cooed, happily patting the creature's head like one would a puppy. Dark shadow, return to me this instant. Takoyami ordered, even grabbing onto his shadow monster and trying to tug him back inside. His face red, either out of embarrassment or anger, or both most likely. Momo didn't care as she had a hand to her mouth. Obey your master at once. Ah shut up. You liked it too. Dark shadow barked, eyeing his master accusingly. He's totally your inner consciousness or something isn't he? Or your true self. Rivu mused with a sly grin. Oh, I never thought of it like that. Kaminari said with a snap of his finger. That's super deep and cool. I wonder what my own dark shadow would be like. Probably someone dumb and goofy. Hagakure said as her gloves pointed at him. We do it. Eh? T that's not true. That's not my inner self. As Momo looked back at her bickering classmates plus Rivu, she saw Habuko and Romero talking excitedly as they walked towards their end of the concourse. They noticed her look and waved, Habuko with a wide grin while Romero was playing it cool. Momo's eyes wandered, seeing Ikari talking to a marching Shishikira, the man stomping as if he was on a warpath and ignoring everything his much larger peer was trying to say. No doubt due to that of the entire group who stopped Genist and his men, Shishikira was the only one of the group who failed. Perhaps that would make him become more open to teamwork in the future. Welp, I gotta head back to my class. Gotta see how my own transfer student is faring. Rivu let go of Dark Shadow and the tan girl walked off. This calls for sushi galore and he's paying. Who's he? The exchange student. Oh yeah, my boyfriend. Rivu explained nonchalantly. Rich kid from the States, but he's a bit snarky but hey... He can fly like a bat so. She shrugged and turned towards Momo. Well, we may not see each other for a while, but look me up on social media. She grinned and winked. You know where to find me. Heck, maybe we can team up again yeah Momo. Working with you would be a beneficial experience Tsunami Sam. Momo bowed lightly. Thank you again for your assistance. I just did my job. See you around. She waved and walked off as Takoyami had finished stuffing Dark Shadow back under his cloak, watching her go out of the corner of his eye. His scowl was present, but he didn't look away. Man yeah Momo, you really have done the coolest stuff. Looking like an action hero back at the sports festival on that rocket board, and now you got to ride on a dragon. Kaminari exclaimed. What's next, going to outer space or something? I bet yeah Momo can totally make a rocket to go to space. Hagakure chimed in. I doubt she can with her current materials. Maybe over time though, Takoyami added in, relieved that the embarrassing situation had been resolved. Momo giggled. A fun assessment. I'd have to look over necessary components of a shuttle or ICBM missile, or some kind. But for now her stomach rumbled. I'll need to grab something quick to eat, after I get changed and showered of course. Luo boy, talk about an exam. Takami Kago, also known as the Winged Hero Hawks, mused as he sat in the VIP area of the main stadium complex. All around him were countless TVs showing various clips of the exams that took place. He was brought on reserve in case Olmira wanted to switch things up, but in the end he wasn't needed. That said, watching Endeavor and his sidekick burn and engage with that hero agency group was entertaining. That brown-haired girl lured Endeavor away and was on the run constantly parkering through hallways and stairwells as the man seemed to be hellbent on teaching her a lesson. All while her comrades managed to overwhelm Burnin and save the building from burning down. Flame Emperor Mafia Dawn and his number two, handled by children. It was quite amusing to Hawks when Endeavor realized it and tried to blaze back to his number two before the time ran out and other pro heroes had arrived for the technical victory condition. Still, why would Endeavor seem to have it out for that round-faced brunette girl anyway? What did she do, insult his mother or something? Either way the brunette was pretty impressive in giving Endeavor the runaround like that. And the number two hero was a damn good actor. Almost had him convinced a few times he wasn't holding back. Welp, it's been fun kicking back. I needed this. He could see other heroes around, talking amongst themselves, but he saw one who was late coming in. And she was glued to one group of monitors in particular when she arrived, and Hawks looked up. Ah oh yes, Peter Parker Aka Spider-Man. The only person to ever psychic with the lone wolf rabbit hero. Yo Mirko. Hawks lazily waved, and the red-eyed tanned woman looked his way with a light glare. At the same time, a highlight of Parker was doing his axe kick on Gang Orca. Like seeing your intern use your move. I would have recognized your lunar ring any day. The rabbit-eared woman scoffed, standing up and marching out of the room. None of your business, Hawks. Was just asking. Hawks raised his arms in a surrendering shrug. He turned, seeing her walk away. 
but not before taking one last look on the screen when Parker got blasted by Orca, only to be saved by the green-haired kid and that Bakugo lad. She muttered something under her breath, and Hawk's little feathers picked up on it. Should have webbed out of there, and she left the room. The blonde man smiled, turning back as he got his phone out. He definitely spotted some useful prospects here. Hero patrols could be a bit of a dull drag most of them. He made a call. Yo, he said, mind putting an offer towards the Tsunami Rivu gal. Kairiu is her hero name. His eyes went to a screen, seeing the girl glomping dark shadow while Takoyami looked like he was going to explode. Yeah, send an invite for a work study to her. She's a little older but hey, she'll add some much needed variety to our agency. Feeling better? Karen asked in his ear. Yeah. Peter replied under his breath as he finally sat down in the cafeteria. Got some feeling back in my fingers again. That sonar blast did a number on me. But, that score I got. He got in the 50 seconds all because of Bakugo as he remembered the notes. Failure to dissolve tense situation, if not encouraging it. That was the biggest one highlighted in red. Sure there was an unsafe handling of civilians, procrastination during investigative period or put in vulnerable position to be saved in battle. He got that but, Peter sighed, rubbing his forehead. Just forget it. You passed. You're one step closer to being a legalized hero. Put it behind you, he thought, though it didn't make him feel any better. You did well fighting through it. Your vitals weren't in any danger, but Gang Orca, quite the opponent. I imagine Tony would consider him a fine candidate for the Avengers if possible. Karen mused in his ear. Amen to that, wouldn't want to fight him solo, he uttered, seeing his tray stocked full of pizza slices as he began to dig in. Hella, needed this, he murmured. Aren't you feeling more accomplished now as well? Karen asked, and Peter knew the reason why as he pulled out his wallet, bringing out an ID card in Japanese, with his birth date, birth city, and name in English, but he was able to translate it as he felt a smile grow on his face, that feeling in his gut fading a little. Provisional Hero License Name, Peter Parker Agency Grade, First Year, High School Quirk, Spider Hero Name, Spider-Man One step closer, Peter mused, putting it back in his wallet. To do what I love most, Karen inquired. Aren't there other things you love to do too? Inventing among other things. Well yeah, I love building and creating gadgets too dot 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 but with this I can finally take that next step in helping others. To save people. You, Momo, Izuku, Mei, my teachers, everyone. I couldn't have done this without them, and I can finally pay them back. Hiya Ace. Um um ph. Peter turned, mouth full of cheese, pepperoni, sauce and bread as he turned, seeing Kirishima beaming his way. Mind if we join ya? Beside him was Shoto, both carrying trays. Peter swallowed and nodded. Shoto's eyes were on the ground. By all means, he gestured. Shoto looked rather neutral, as always, as he sat down with his bowl of ramen. Kirishima had a tray chock full of meat. So, how did you guys do? I passed. Kirishima exclaimed as if on cue, at the same time. Me too, Shoto said ruefully, and Peter paused in his bite, looking at him in surprise. Congratulations man. Are you okay? You kinda look pissed off about passing. I am. Shoto suddenly snarled, eyes widening which made both Kirishima and Peter inch away before he seemed to calm himself, sighing. I'll get by. I just have to find a way to fix this. Shoto replied. Wait, you wanted to fail? Hiroshima asked. Peter tilted his head, not understanding the logic. Under the circumstances, yes, the teen hissed again. Just eat your lunch. I need to think. Sorry for the snap. It's fine dude, it's been a long few days. Peter waved it off. Hiroshima nodded. Shoto nodded, and then focused on his ramen, eating mechanically. Hiroshima and Peter shared a look before shrugging, deciding that they'd touch this problem with a 10-foot pole tomorrow or something. I was surprised I passed too, but I got by. Hiroshima said as he dug into his steak, eyeing Shoto out of the corner of his eye but directing his attention Peter's way. Like, the research stuff was super hard. He spoke with a full mouth, Shoto's eyes looking his way. But, he swallowed finally. We got through it. By the third day before this exam I got it down pretty well. My head was frigging killing me with all that thinking and reading. Just getting into the action was a relief for me. Tell me about it. Our group had it a little rough too. Peter mused as he resumed eating, frowning a little. Oh hey Peter. Todoroki. Hiroshima. Peter's mood changed as he turned, seeing Izuku approach with his own tray. Beside him, Momo was approaching with two trays worth of burgers, fries, and rice bowls. Whoa, yay Yorazu with a meal of champions. Hiroshima uttered as the two joined them at the table, Izuku and Momo sitting on opposing sides of Peter as Kirishima and Shoto sat across. I did spend a lot of lipids during my confrontation against Best Genus and his men. 
Momo said as she began to eat at her first of two rice bowls. I need to replenish. You went up against the number four hero. Peter gawked. And you won. She she said, rubbing his head while suddenly feeling a little inadequate. What about you guys? Midoriya. Base. Hiroshima inquired. We were on the same team actually. Izuku replied with a light smile. We were paired up with Shoji and Kaken. Oh, and Monoma and Shizaki from Class 1B. As for who we went up against, it was Gang Orca. Dang, you guys got someone in the top 10 too. We just fought a retired hero Kirishima admitted, feeling a little less proud of his own accomplishment. Who did you face exactly to come out of retirement? Izuku asked. The dual-haired boy swallowed. Say Kaio, ring any bells. S sorry, the name may have been before All Might's time. She looked like she came from the Sengoku period, she was so old. But man she was manly too. Hiroshima exclaimed, fists pumped up and grinning. Like fighting all of us at once and not even moving from her spot. I can't imagine what she was like in her prime. It's not very proper to comment on a woman's age or call them manly Kirishima. Momo admonished him as she finished her rice bowl. Yeah, gotta keep a filter on that, dude. Peter remarked with a light smile as he finished up his pizza. Hiroshima looked a little bashful as he rubbed the back of his head. He set his phone down and looked up, seeing Yu's message. Hey Peter, heard you took your exam. When you get home, let's go out for Tepan. Peter beamed, typing back. You got it you. See you in a couple of hours. Talking to someone. Izuku asked and Peter looked up, grinning at Izuku. Just you is all. Going to get a celebratory dinner with her tonight. Oh yeah, when is Aizawa sensei gonna pick us up? Hiroshima's eyes widened as he brought his bowl to his lips and drank. We got a schedule. We have 30 minutes, Shoto said in monotone, poking his ramen aimlessly. He sent an email to all of us that he will pick us up at 2.30 and take us back to school. Hiroshima brought the bowl down, cheeks full as he gulped down the broth, noodles, meat and... Did he just swallow that egg too? Ugh, I haven't checked. They have eggs and ramen, Peter asked, and all eyes were on him. Um, um yes. Is that a problem? Shoto's eyebrow quirked, his prior displeasure forgotten. Oh, I think in America they only do it cup style. You know, instant. Izuku said as he was still scribbling in his notes. I've had to make do with cup ramen a ton back home as well. Not exactly much of a cook when it comes to that sort of thing. Peter admitted, mentally recalling some of the times he'd also eaten instant back in New York. Really ace. Me too. Best stuff right there. Hiroshima offered a fist, and Peter took it, grinning back. They'd pound down five instants before working out. Instant, Momo shivered, looking a bit nauseous. Peter said, if you'd like, I would be happy to introduce you to a ramen shop sometime. A, traditional ramen place. Peter blinked. Traditional how? Well, one that is proper. With bean sprouts, spinach and all the necessary ingredients that a good ramen provides. Momo replied, eyes closed as she finished her first batch of fries and picked up her hamburger. I'm pretty comfortable with a nice warm batch of meat, noodles and broth. Hiroshima crossed his arms with a sharp grin. Well, I guess I wouldn't mind actually. Peter smiled. I mean, nothing wrong trying something new. Just like... He bit his lip, looking to the side. Like what? Momo inquired as Shoto finished his meal. Will it have like, chicken feet or, cow tongue or stomach or something? I mean, I know the traditional places back home in New York have them but like, I dunno. Momo tilted her head. You've been in Japan for over a year and a half, and you haven't tried our traditional cuisine. Momo inquired as Peter rubbed his arm, blushing lightly. Shame, shame Peter, Karen said in his ear. How can you not broaden your horizons? Heh, I was just going to what's familiar. Peter grinned widely. Well, I won't hold it against you. Momo answered primly, obviously trying to be diplomatic. Everyone must start someplace. Okay. Peter clapped his hands together. I will aim to try out more traditional Japanese food. Pre-New Year's resolution. It's September though, Shoto remarked. Like I said, pre-New Year's. Well done young Midoriya. You, me and Melissa must go out to celebrate. All Might had typed. I know of a peculiar place uptown we should try. I would love to bring you. All Might was inviting Izuku out for dinner with Melissa. Izuku grinned as he carried his hero costume case and a bag of the clothes the HPSC had given them. The rest of class was gathering on the bus as Izuku began to take note of his peers, Peter, Yeyurazu, Todoroki and Kirishima following behind. Takoyami was talking in earnest with the likes of Ida, Ajiro and Hagakure who seemed quite pleased. Kaminari seemed to be patting a downtrodden Siro on the back, while Jiru was talking with Suyu and Ishido. Kaken was sulking by a tree, but Koda seemed to be talking energetically with him. Izuku gave him a wave, the blonde seeing it before quietly averting his eyes. Koda at least waved back, and the green-haired boy smiled a little. 
Aizawa stood before the bus, hands in his pockets. All right, should be about everyone. Stow your costumes and let's get going. He got on board as everyone began loading their belongings in the luggage compartment. Ida and Momo helped ferry everyone in, with Peter hanging back and getting a head count before he joined the line. They all got inside, with Izuku sitting beside Peter while on the other side. Todoroki sat with Momo as everyone was a buzz. You were up against Wash. Talk about a rough matchup. Suyu mused as she spoke with Siro. Yeah, my tape kept on getting washed away. How was I supposed to know that walking, talking appliance could just fire a frigging cyclone from his stomach? Siro yelled, sighing at his unfortunate testing results. My entire team was not ready for that. Got our whole building flooded. We should have swapped places. I was up against Ryukyu. Suyu mused before Aizawa got in, standing at the front of the bus and everyone stopped talking. Good, everyone's all here. Aizawa mused. Now, I know it's been a long three days, so we will have a brief homeroom here before we head back to UA. It'll be after school hours so no need to host a meeting there. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you were not able to pass? He asked, getting right to it, and Izuku saw the hands raised, zeroing in on those who hadn't. Siro, Sato, and Aoyama. The green-haired boy felt bad for the blonde. He'd failed the final, and now this. H&M. I see. Aizawa murmured. All right, I imagine you all must feel down at the moment, but keep your heads up. They are offering remedial classes so you can earn your license in December rather than retake the exam next March. Curiously, Izuku noticed Todoroki's head turn to Aizawa, suddenly attentive. Hadn't he passed? Are you taking it? Aizawa continued. I'll be able to take it. Sato muttered, sitting beside Ajiro as the tailed boy gave his taller peer a pat on the shoulder. Same, Siro added, looking like he was already dreading what awaited him. I have an important holiday in December, my family and I are going to see relatives in Paris. Aoyama said, his tone soft, so I wouldn't be able to take part in the final portion of the classes in December even if I wanted to. Talk it over with me and I'll arrange a course schedule for you, Aoyama. Aizawa added, those who are taking the classes talk with me and send me your schedule for the remedials. We will work around it together. He grabbed some eye drops and began to apply them to his eyes. You're all still at a point in your career where you can afford to make mistakes. Learn from these last few days on what you can do to become better. You've fallen a step behind, so you'll need to work harder from here on out. Understand? A chorus of affirmations from the three as Aizawa focused on the rest of the class. Now then, tomorrow is set so I'm giving you the day off combined with Sunday. We will meet again on Monday morning to discuss what to do from there. For those who passed and received your licenses, congratulations. You took the first big step in your hero careers. With your provisional licenses, you'll be able to legally take action in any heroic capacity, even without a pro hero's guidance as well, as long as it's an emergency you can act. Aizawa explained, I trust you'll use this privilege well and not abuse it. He let that statement hang for a moment before continuing. Izuku looked over, and Peter was looking away, hand on his forehead at that. That's right, the stain hunt in the aftermath with Mirko. He looked down at his license once more, seeing his likeness and name. He felt his eyes water up, and he felt a nudge. Midori, what was that? Peter asked, and Izuku looked over in confusion. You sounded like you were choking, or groaning. He leaned over. Yo Shoto, Momo, did you hear that? I did. Sounded like a creaky door. Momo mused, and Izuku clamped up. Agreed, Shoto added, and Izuku went bone white. Yo, don't get all sick and pale on us Midoriya. Hiroshima was behind them, poking his head out. You need to see a doctor before we leave. Sensei's sitting down and all. Thank goodness I saw one. Yoraka added as Izuku perked up, seeing the girl lean in from her side of the aisle. I had to deal with Endeavor on my butt for ten minutes. I think I lost ten years off my life. You faced my father. Shoto asked as she perked up. Why yeah? Achako mumbled, scratching the back of her head. I mean, I was kinda. From what I hear you were totally awesome. Siro suddenly chimed in, his previous gloom vanishing as he turned his grin towards the rest of the class. She totally led the biggie on a runaround, while dodging fireballs. Yuraka remembered it distinctly less dodging and more along the lines of panicked flailing. But she kept mum on that, and throwing giant rocks. Siro continued, it was the only thing I could find while I was on the run. The brunette was looking more and more flustered as Izuku saw the grins grow on everyone around him. Even sent him on a wild goose chase out a window and brought the roof down on him. I was just trying to not get set on fire. Yuraka had her hands covering her face and she slowly began to float up. Shoto, who was sitting in front of her, grabbed her sleeve and helped pull her down. Th that's not. Wow Achako, when did you take a level in badass and not tell anyone? Nina screamed, her smile wide as she ran up to the brunette. I I didn't. 
Hey, is it true you threw him down an elevator shaft? You did, Shoto asked, eyes widening in awe as the girl had her arms wrapped around her head. I threw myself down the shaft. Endeavor followed. She grimaced, not sure if that made it better or worse. That's so cool. Hiroshima roared. You gotta fight me at some point. I bet you could even give Bakugo a good fight. A pair of very red, very angry eyes rounded on her from up front. Koda patted the bomber's shoulder in assurance. Iraraka was not having a good day. Shoto keeping her from floating away with Jiru coming forward to help with her opposing sleeve. That's amazing. Momo exclaimed. Fighting the number two hero alone is no small feat even if he was holding back. Holding back my foot, Yuraka thought, indignant. Yeah, and taking one for the team by diverting the final boss onto you while your comrades accomplish your goal. Fighting him one-on-one -on -one in solo combat. Now that's, Kirishima sniffed a bit, rubbing his eyes. You're manly as hell, Yuraka. I'm not manly. The girl gawked as she floated back down in her seat as Shoto stared at her with wide eyes. What did you do to make him so angry? He inquired, looking at her with great interest. I beamed him over the head with a plank of wood. She fiddled with her fingers, blushing. Oh, he's gonna blackball me for sure. Shoto's depressive state seemed to have brightened up, the lips curving into a light smile, and something escaped his lips. Shoto did you? Just laugh, Peter said, all eyes on Shoto. Izuku himself couldn't believe it. Yuraraka, bashing the number two hero in the country with a plank. Oh man, he could never imagine himself doing that to All Might. I never mind. Shoto took a deep breath, sighing while mentally reminding himself to ask Achako for more details later. Maybe even see if he could get a recording of the moment. Still, you made quite the noise earlier, Midoriya. He said, looking at the green-haired boy. What was that for? Oh oh, I mean, sorry I just... Izuku looked down at his license. I'm just so happy is all. So many people helped me along the way, so... Seeing this, he smiled again as he lifted the license up closer to his face. This is a sign of progress that I'm one step closer to being the hero I want to be. And I'm just... I'm happy. He sighed, leaning back. Izuku looked down at his license, sighing and beaming. Oh right. He felt the bus lurch as it got moving. I gotta tell mom. Maybe invite her to come out with me and Melissa and All Might too. He mumbled under his breath, pulling out his phone. You're going out to celebrate and eat too? Peter asked. Um, why ya yeah, I am? Izuku looked back and nodded. Where are you going? Local tappin place you knows about. One of my favorite joints actually. Where were you thinking of going? Peter asked, and Izuku opened his mouth to answer as Peter's head jolted, and he was glued to the glass. No way. He shouted in English, and it startled Izuku. He even heard a surprised Kaya. From Yuraraka. T. Peter. He gawked, and he heard movement. Is something the mad oh? The Lego Emporium. Shoto mused, and Izuku saw it as they left the complex and passed by a massive store of sorts. The largest Lego store in Asia apparently. It was massive, about five stories on a high rise. Izuku could see the giant colorful Lego store and people going inside as he heard a noise coming out of Peter, like a gasp or a shuddering moan of awe. That didn't sound normal. Yuraraka mused. Um, um Peter San, are you okay? Momo inquired. The American perked up before sitting back down and patting his cheeks. As sorry, he was blushing, rubbing the back of his head. I haven't seen one in a while. He looked to the side. Things have been so busy that I haven't really indulged. Indulged. Like a hobby. Momo tilted her head. I didn't consider you to be such a fan of Legos. Oh yeah, back at home I would go for the best and most complex kits. Peter replied. I love building them. He said, giving a nostalgic air about the way he said it. I never really got into them myself, Momo mentioned. Well, it's mostly Death Stars. Really hard stuff. The girl tilted her head. Death Stars? She asked. Peter just stared at her as a tiny little tear came out of his eye. Okay, so there's this movie series called Star Wars and never heard of it myself. Momo mused, but she then perked up as she saw Peter's face beginning to fall. What do you mean it's faded into obscurity? Peter uttered to himself in English. Izuku was puzzled. What do you mean he felt his phone buzz and he looked down. I'm filling him in. It was from Karen, and Peter lied back against his seat, quickly realizing the gravity of what he'd just realized. There's gonna be no Death Star or Star Destroyer kits. Not even. A frigging droid control ship. Peter spoke to himself in English, looking pale. I can't say I know of those terms Peter, Momo spoke in English as Izuku looked her way. But Death Star does remind me of the Solar Crusher. That's a popular thing from that. I think it's Galactic Legends. Hey wait, we talking in English now? Hiroshima asked aloud, feeling left out. Why's that? Peter asked, almost feeling numb. Sounds like it's for kids. Only the most popular sci-fi hero series around. 
Izuku mused in Japanese, picking up enough to understand. A lot of heroes back in the day were inspired by them. Had a popular franchise too. Peter blinked at Shoto's edition. Huh, so, where can I start? He asked, going back to Japanese, as Momo giggled. I can share my streaming service so you can get started. And, I heard that Lego has quite the collection of kits on them. The American had a small smile blossom as he nodded, looking off to the road as Izuku saw a small forlorn look on his face. As sure, he looked back, smiling again. I'd love to get started when I can. And, I like building them with a friend. Maybe we can do some building together. I don't know where I can fit a Lego model in my own room. Izuku admitted, blushing. When you have loads of All Might merchandise and action figures. The but maybe I can make some room. Maybe I can find something I'd like. I wouldn't mind trying it. It could be fun. Momo smiled, hands on her lap. I haven't built a Lego before. Iroraka mused. Me neither. Shoto added. I wouldn't mind building a Lego. Maybe I can get smarter by building something. Maybe there's hidden math equations going along with building it. Like, that's how architects do things right. Kirishima had an arm raised, and Peter let out a laugh and leaned back in his seat. So Peter, Izuku murmured. What was that Star Wars you mentioned anyway? You did seem rather intrigued by it. Momo asked, and Peter grinned. Well, it started off with a guy from California named George Lucas. Thank you for the meal, Izuku exclaimed, as did everyone else as they sat at the restaurant. His mother and Melissa were right beside him, and a shrunken All Might in front of him, all of them looking at him with pride and joy. Izuku and his mother had settled for pork cutlet, and All Might for beef while Melissa had chosen tofu. Thank you so much for coming out, Inko said with pride as she began to eat from her order. I must say, I never would have thought that Yue would have such a kind and supportive teacher like you, Yagi-san. All Might laughed, rubbing the back of his head. Don't mention it. Young Midoriya and I are similar in a lot of ways, Yagi explained. When he arrived at school he and I seemed to click, so I've been giving him pointers on how to master his quirk. And he had a hand in saving me at I Island too. Melissa added, least I can do is support my hero. She teased with a wink, Izuku flushing while Inko blinked. Then she grinned behind her water glass, a grin that made her son uneasy. It's not like that mom, he wanted to say, but kept quiet due to the slight thundering in his chest. His mother turned towards the slim man. I can't thank you enough for that too, Yagi-san. Inko said before she drank some water. So, you're chaperoning All Might's ward for the day too. Oh yes, Yagi laughed a little. The big guy is always super busy, and Melissa wanted to see how young Midoriya was doing. So he asked me for a favor. He grinned, eyes closed. Guess the number one hero owes me, huh? So he does. To think that All Might of all people would take an interest in my boy. Inko sighed in relief and pride, sniffling a bit. You have no idea what this means for me. Thank you. Don't thank him, just thank All Might, Melissa said with a cheeky grin, to which Izuku responded with an awkward one in kind. I must say though Melissa, how are you adapting to life here in Japan? Your Japanese is exemplary, Inko complimented, but will you be returning to I Island at some point? What will you be doing in the meantime? I'm taking all of my other classes online. I still plan to graduate from my academy, Melissa responded, but Yue was kind enough to let me use their support department to work on my gear. Besides, I have a few ideas for support tech that can help Izuku. She beamed towards Izuku, and the boy was beginning to feel warm. I say you two get along great, All Might said, and Inko looked like she was ready to glomp her son while Izuku was looking as red as the top of the soy sauce bottle. My son is such a good boy. His plump mother rubbed her eyes a little before perking up. Oh, let me tell you of the time me and him used to play hero when he was a kid. Izuku paled. M mom. Melissa grinned ear to ear, while Yagi simply drank his teacup in both hands, with a bony pinky out. Oh, what did he do? Melissa asked, eyes wide as she gazed at Izuku with a playful look in her eye. Izuku groaned as Inko laughed. Oh, I would be in a blanket and he would be dressed up in his adorable All Might pajamas. Izuku's groaning was beginning to sound like a creaking door as Melissa giggled incessantly. For what it's worth Izuku, I wore the same when I was a kid too. Melissa assured him, patting his shoulder on his far side as her chest brushed against his arm. It's alright, trust me, she said with an assuring smile. The creaking door was getting louder as Izuku was looking more akin to a tomato with the hair on his head resembling the leafy stem. All Might could only laugh as Inko began to tell her tale. Izuku would feel a little lightheaded at times but, the sight of his mother being so happy and glad, All Might eating with him, and Melissa despite her playfulness being helpful. All of that made the embarrassing family stories worth it in the end. What a day. Izuku sighed as they arrived home. All Might and Melissa went in their own car as he rode with Inko. His mother was pleased as they walked inside. 
You must be so tired, baby. And Ko hung up her coat on the rack as the plump woman looked his way. Your show's recorded too while you are gone. Izuku perked up, turning before looking back to the living room. Oh, is Hiro watch on? Izuku mused. That was one of his favorite shows to watch in order to analyze future heroes and their quirks. He hadn't had a chance to catch it lately. Should be around that time. Inko yawned. I'm going to take a shower. Do you need one first Izuku? I'll be fine. You go ahead mom. I'll watch my show and take it after you. He smiled as he trotted over and plopped down on the couch, turning on the TV. Today on the Hero Watch Board, we are going to be going over the top hero student prospects in the country. Host Kaipa Denji exclaimed. The man with dog-like ears stood beside two notable analysts. Kawakami Kayoshiro, a rather bland-looking man with a stern expression and Hijikata Megumi, a woman with her nose being an electrical socket, all dressed up in suits. With news of the HPSC provisional license exam coming to a close, combined with individual tryouts and events for other hero exams ending that started with the vaunted UA sports festival. It's time to go to our big board to see who has the best projection to be the top pro hero. As the board between them came alive, a holographic display of names and photos came up. Izuku has always wanted to be on that board, to know that he had what it takes to be seen and recognized as a legitimate great hero to be. With the exam coming to a close, his third place finish at the festival and recent events, surely he might be recognized right. Of the names and schools displayed in the top 10 prospects, only four names from UA stood out to him from the top down. Tagata Mirio ranked first, Yuraka Achako ranked third, Yeyorazu ranked eighth, and Peter Parker ranked ninth. Still, no sign of himself on there. Izuku winced, so this is what's on your big board and agreed upon Kawakami, Hijikata. Kaipa inquired. Indeed. Kawakami surmised as, beside him, video highlights were on display showcasing the top 10 prospects' feats. Izuku noticed his classmates in costume, notably Spider-Man with Mirko, Yeyorazu at Hasu with Yorai Musha, and Yuraraka jumping along a cliff face with Pixie Bob. We have an impressive crop this year, with new faces coming out in light of recent events such as the UA sports festival, various incidents across the country, and the recent provisional exam held by the HPSC. However, topping the list is still in my book, Tagata Mirio. On a screen was the image of a tall and rather muscular blonde teen, clad in a white and blue outfit, red cape and the number one million in gold across his chest. Lamillion has been a consummate pro over this last year, surging out of nowhere to be my top prospect for hero agencies to hire. His speed and unique quirk make him an ideal hero of sorts, combined with his personality. Kawakami gestured towards the feats of that blonde boy that looked familiar to Izuku. However, we have an impressive crop so far from what we have heard and seen. Yeyorazu Momo in particular here. Kawakami looked over to the panels and screens showcasing the black-haired girl at the sports festival and at Hasu. She was instrumental in helping neutralize and chase off the hero killer stain, and her quirk offers a vast array of items that makes her a walking Swiss army knife. Just imagine the possibilities once she hits the ground running. And we need to take into account her offshore feats as well. He sounded excited, and Izuku saw the news coverage panel of I Tower in smoke. She was instrumental in saving hostages during the Eye Island crisis, assisting the likes of All Might and Endeavor in subduing the villains. Already, her jump in experience is nothing short of extraordinary to behold. And that's not even getting into her amazing leadership in the provisional exam, in which she led the charge against Best Genus, the number 4 hero and came out on top. In an exam setting where he held back significantly, Hijikata critiqued. True, but even so, I know Genus well enough not to hold back. Let's take a look at his exit after the exam, as he gave our Kawajima Ryasuke an interview. Kawakami gestured to the camera as a new clip came on screen. Best genus appeared, the man holding an ice pack on his head. I can safely say that the next crop of heroes coming down the pipeline have plenty of promise. It seems to me that those UA, ones in particular may be the most obvious of note. He winced, rubbing his pack on his crown. And Yeyorazu Momo is another one to come out of that hero factory that is UA. Keep an eye out on her, and agencies need to put on their best dress to impress the future top pro creati, in my opinion. Kawakami stepped back, saying his piece. That's all well and good, but Yeyorazu is only ranked 8th on your list. Wherever did this UA, girl Yuraraka Achako come from? Kaipa exclaimed in surprise, pointing to her. Ijikata seemed to roll her eyes as Kawakami smirked. She has had an exemplary exam, one that floored me. She gave the number 2 hero in this country the runaround. Kawakami laughed. Who gives the number two hero, who never gives half efforts, trouble enough for him to give this interview? 
The next clip displayed Endeavor of all people marching off. Endeavor, said some journalist, probably that Kawajima fellow again. Similar voice. There's been trending hashtags online of a UA student having defeated you while you were in the position as temporary villain. Can you give us your opinion on this student? Endeavor stopped, turned around and glared at the journalist as if they had insulted his mother before his flames rippled and he took off into the sky. Oh come on. The journalist cried before the broadcast went back to the three people in the studio, Kaipa looking ready to laugh while Kawakami looked smug. I believe he did not deny that. And Endeavor's silence usually resonates as a confirmation from the rumors spreading online from the original hashtag of a sticky armsy 1212. Kaipa acknowledged. Exactly Kaipa Kun. Kawakami said with a snap of his fingers. On top of past research of this student, one year Araka Achako, doing well out with the pussycat several months ago, a hero as well-rounded as this one. A photo of a smiling Uraraka was on the screen. Is just the kind of thing we need in this society. All well and good. Hijikata. But handling a nature park and trumping a hero who was holding back in an exam setting doesn't amount to much. The woman then pointed at the screen. After all Kawakami-kun, you forget what we do on this show. It's to discuss and analyze who can be the top pro. She gestured to a spread of screens where Lamillion was neutralizing some thugs with blinding speed and Peter acting to stop a van. However, if there's anyone who has an argument to be the top pro, Hijikata stepped up, gesturing towards Spider-Man. It's Spider-Man. His strength and feats have drawn comparisons to an early All Might in his day, and that's not even getting into his sports festival performance. Not to mention that Peter Parker is only a freshman at UA, while Lamillion is a third year. For all we know, he could be maxed out on potential. For someone to be seen as the top pro, they need to have a ceiling that is sky high. Or he could be a late bloomer. Kawakami countered. Lamillion has undergone plenty of drug busts and villain hunts this last year which is unheard of for a teenage hero sidekick. Suffice to say, he's on a fast track to being a top 10 pro the moment he graduates. Yes, but Peter Parker has the benefit of being inside a strong freshman class at UA. On top of that, he doesn't seem to have that all-might kind of impact just yet. Kaipa interjected before the two were about to argue, Izuku feeling a little emptiness growing within him. From the exam, for instance, he gestured to more screens. We have some insider info that Peter Parker, for someone who is being hailed as the next all-might, was unable to really do much against a held-back gang orca. Is that so bad though? You saw his performance at the sports festival, Hijikata exclaimed. And if he was able to win over M.I.R.K.O. of all people behind closed doors. Gotta see more. Kawakami mused. Can't be the next All Might if you struggle against the number 11 hero and need backup. Izuku looked at the screen. Kawakami and Hijikata's ratings selling bickering droning out as he gazed at the photo of All Might hanging on the wall in the living room. He needed to become better than All Might, that was true. But right now, where was he? How good of a hero is he? Where was he compared to those high up the ladder? He knew that he needed to take this one step at a time, but to become better than All Might. Izuku looked up, seeing highlights of All Might in action with other heroes. One notable clip near to him was Peter swinging in action when he was with Mirko. He wanted no. I need to know where I am, where I stand next to them. Izuku sighed and got up before he walked towards the kitchen. That thought niggled him in the back of his head for the rest of the night. Finally I'm home. Peter muttered as he walked into the apartment, closing the door behind him. Frigging bus traffic was a nightmare. There you are. You cheered, the blonde sitting up from the couch as she was lounging. She trotted over, embracing her roommate with a hug as Peter welcomed it. Sorry for not mentioning the road work being done around town. Should have just webbed on over. Peter mused with a playful sigh. That would require you being a pro hero first. You winked. Speaking oo off, did you pass? Peter looked at her before showing his wallet and pulling out his new license with a beaming smile. You squealed. Oh, we are definitely doing tap on. You turned around, going into her side of the flat. Go ahead and get dressed if you want. She called out before she stopped, Peter chuckling lightly. He was able to take a nap on the bus ride after he explained the Star Wars movies to his friends, so he felt a little fresh as he set his bags and belongings in his room and rested on the couch. He turned, seeing you still standing in her doorway, her reaching down towards a countertop and holding a card of some kind. You? He asked, perking up as the blonde woman stowed away the card. She looked back at him, and she looked awkward. So, ooh, you know what? It can wait till after Tepon. You said with a cheery smile that wouldn't fool anyone. You, Peter said, what's up? The blonde tapped the card in her hand, eyes flickering before holding it out. Just, something that I think could help you. Peter raised an eyebrow, taking a hold of the offered card. 
a name, an address, certified, psychologist, a therapist. Now I know that this is a little sudden, you said, but I think that. I need a shrink. He finished. Lips curled as he looked back at her. He wasn't. Angry. Or at least he hoped not. You winced. I. It's just something to. Help you get through stuff. I mean. She looked to the side. Unsure of how to continue the sentence. Peter took a deep, slow breath. Trying to step back and look at this as objectively as he could. She did know of his past. He did tell her back then. After Mirko kicked him out for the stain hunt. Still. I. Thanks you. He said. Feeling a little clammy. I mean it. But I'm fine. He put on a reassuring smile, one that made Yu's own expression shift. Suddenly Peter felt like he was watching a replay of Yu in the blonde woman's eyes. Only it was himself. Besides, I got my license, we can talk about that, so let's go, he said, turning on his heel. He saw Yu reach out for him in the corner of his eye, but she paused. Just, think about it, please, for me, she asked, trying not to sound forceful. Peter stopped, glancing back. Yu looked almost like he was going to snap at her, nervous and hoping. He sighed. He owed it to her to at least try and think about it. I promise, he said. Yu's lips twitched, a slow smile coming over her. All right, then let's go, she said. We can't be out too long. Well, we might, if you go off on how things were back in your day when you got your license. I am not that old, you declared. Besides, you could learn from my experience. Peter let himself chuckle as he closed the door in his room. He took one more glance at the card before putting it on his headrest. He'd think about it. But for now, there was a celebration that he needed to get to. By the time Todoroki and Ji returned home he was tired, irritated, and gritting his teeth as at least half the pings on his phone were reminding him of that irritating round-faced upstart who hit him over the head with a block of wood. So all in all, he was nowhere near a proper state of mind to have a calm, civil discussion with anyone. So when he marched inside his house only to hear Fayumi nervously calling his son, and then saw his youngest marching towards him with grit teeth, and a thunderous expression, and he briefly wondered if the front half of his house would survive the coming storm. Because if Shoto pushed on his last nerve right now, the Todoroki patriarch was hardly hurting for cash to make repairs and he could use the stress relief of a proper explosion. Shoto, he greeted as neutrally as possible. You had no right to rig that exam. Endeavor prided himself on his ability to control his expressions. It was necessary when you didn't, strictly speaking, wear a mask. It reduced your tells, kept your enemies guessing. But Shoto's accusation made even his control slip, eyes going slightly wide and an incredulous eyebrow hiking up to his forehead. The hell are you talking about? Don't play dumb. The boy shouted. I had no right to pass if Kendo didn't. You made those judges give me the points, didn't you? Seriously. The eldest Todoroki scoffed. Of course his son would sabotage his own performance to humiliate him. After everything he'd done for him, this was how he repaid him acting out over some no-name. I did no such thing. He spoke low. If you passed it was on your own merits and if you failed it would have been your failure. He pointed at his son, his voice now loud. Not mine. Maybe we should calm down. His daughter called from her place down the hall, inching forward with cautious, hesitant steps. And she saw his son's face close off, like a gate slamming shut and his eyes glaring like knives. Endeavor had seen this expression enough to know what it meant. And she scoffed. It doesn't matter what I tell you. You've already determined what I did regardless of what I have to say about it. He marched past the boy. If you wanted some girl to pass, perhaps teach her to be better, rather than foisting your failures onto me. Go to hell. Shoto barked, his left side looking ready to ignite. Endeavor stilled. He turned, looking over his shoulder, and the look in his eye made even Shoto's temper cool as the boy visibly straightened. He was glaring back however, standing his ground. Forcing himself to, Fayumi flinched and hid behind the sliding door. An endeavor forced himself to remain calm. You're angry, the number two hero said in a voice so quiet it barely carried. So I'll let that slide. Once, he raised a single finger. You will not disrespect me like that again. I don't care how angry you think you are. He hissed. Do you understand? Shoto snarled. She deserved to pass this exam. Then why didn't she? He retorted on the spot. Because I'm your son. His boy bit out. She doesn't merit that. Consideration. Endeavor's eyes narrowed. He turned away and kept walking into his home, hearing Fayumi behind him sigh in relief. As per usual, they would have dinner at different times of the night. Thank you Madu-san, Momo said as she departed from the limo, staring up at her mansion as the driver began to guide the limo into the seven-car garage just down the road. Momo carried her bag towards the ornate front door and opened it. I'm home. She called out, the sun having already set and night having fallen. She felt a sense of relief enter her. Madu picking her up from UA. They'd caught the unfortunate end of rush hour traffic. 
At least the limo had AC and a phone charger, but the girl just wanted to be back in her own home. Welcome home, young mistress, Fujimura, one of the elder maids with graying streaks in her black hair, replied with a light bow as she approached. How was your school excursion? It was fine, Momo said as she walked past. Our mother and father around. They are in a business meeting at the moment in Shinjuku. Had to be in person, Fujimura replied. The lady was quite upset. From what I have heard, a hedge fund tried to cheat your father. I do not envy them. Momo replied as she set her backpack by the stairs. The girl walked over to the living room and plopped down on the luxury couch and rested her head on the pillows. Shall I have the cooks prepare something for you miss? Your examination must have consumed a lot of lipids, I'd wager. Fujimura asked. Momo could hear the sound of movement upstairs. Must have been several other maids at work, usually dusting or vacuuming to keep things tidy. Just prepare a mighty dozen shake please. I'm feeling a need for greens at the moment. Momo looked back at the woman who had helped her mother change her diapers. I had a lot for lunch so I'll be fine. As you wish, young mistress. Fujimura smiled, bowing and walking off as Momo turned on the television with her remote. On the first channel was a popular hero talk show, already beginning a segment. Going by the tagline, the show was named Twilight Hero Talk. So now the first thing we are going to get into, the host, an ordinary woman with short black hair, said. Her tagline was Asanagi Maria, was the subject regarding a popular trend that is going on in America, particularly heroes seeking therapy. Joining us to discuss this segment alongside our host Akatsuki Yorichi is Miyagi Dekaku from Channel 2 News. Thank you so much for coming on, Miyagi-san. A pleasure. The older man with wrinkles and soft blonde hair nodded, one of his two horns having been sawed off. Momo remembered. He was the newscaster who made big news removing said horn to make his job at the station easier. Caused quite a stir in the news and social media. So, Akatsuki-san, Asanagi looked over to her fellow co-host, a rather beautiful-looking woman with soft red eyes and black hair in a fashionable red business attire. You've noticed how overseas in America, Heroes have been attending counseling and therapy lately. Out of curiosity, what do you think of this? You brought this up in the production meeting. It caught me by surprise as well, for this to be our first topic on my first appearance on the show. Miyagi added. Well, Akatsuki mused. I am only bringing this up as I am pondering on certain things. How can we make our heroes better? In America this trend has been picking up more and more, even after it was widely accepted overseas. When my family and I returned from vacation, we realize that here in Japan we don't really seem to offer such services to our heroes. It makes one think is all. The woman leaned back in her chair. After all, it was here in Japan that heroism began to take off and then spread all across the globe. So why not learn from others? Far from me to criticize it, but Miyagi leaned forward a little. I think the reasoning is simple. Akatsuki-san. You are quirkless? Yes. I am yes. The woman chuckled. The irony of someone quirkless like me hosting a hero talk show. I get that a lot. Of course, not a problem at all. But tell me, what do you think of someone who is in need of therapy? He said while grimacing, the words almost appearing to be bitter in his mouth. That such an individual is someone in need of help. That is true, yes. And tell me, do you want to be saved from someone who needs help? Then, by all reasons, that person is not a hero, someone who helps and aids others. Miyagi straightened up. After all, how can one even save others if they themselves are damaged individuals? With powerful quirks capable of leveling city blocks and causing billions of yen and property damages, and that's not even going into potential casualties of civilians either in case of villain attacks. All I wish to say is that we should extend heroes a helping hand. Akatsuki replied, After all, are they not as human as we are? A hero by its very definition is a person who is admired for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. Miyagi said, that to me, and I imagine to many of the public, is someone who is beyond human and something extraordinary. After all, we do live in a superhuman society. I myself am not a hero, but I only removed my horn here so that it doesn't get in the way of my work. But surely the things heroes go through in everyday life, surely they could use help on the couch. Are you implying that the heroes who are tasked with keeping this society afloat Akatsuki-san? have mental or emotional disorders? Miyagi asked, and the red-eyed woman blinked. After all, according to the World Hero Association charts, our heroes have a better overall grade and quality in many heroic aspects compared to the United States. Well I mean, I only wish that they can be helped and to become better heroes. Akatsuki frowned a bit, and that last one is misleading. America has over 600 million people so their hero quantity would vastly outnumber ours. I only want to bring this subject up is to ask the question on how we can better help the heroes on the street. 
which comes from the implication that they themselves are not suitable to defend our citizens and keep order. To me Akatsuki-san, that is a sign of a wireless individual, and that someone, if they seek the things you have described, is not worthy of being a hero. The buzz of her phone caught Momo off as she sat up, reaching into her school jacket pocket to pull it out. It had some texts. Momo went to the remote, changing the channel to the weather. It was from her dad, no doubt responding to her I passed the exam text she sent while on the car drive home. This meeting may take a little while longer. Your mother is eating them alive. It was from father. Okay, Momo replied. Don't let me distract you. Your drink, young mistress. Fujimura came by with a large glass of a deep green juice filled with a combination of various spices, fruits, and vegetables. Thank you. Momo took it and leaned back with a sigh. It felt nice to relax at home every now and then. After a moment she perked up. Oh yes that's right, I need to set things up. She got her phone out, going to the group chat and spotting Peter in it, tapping on his icon and going to FaceTime. The phone buzzed a bit, and there was Peter sitting at a restaurant. Hey a Momo, Peter said as Momo chuckled a bit. Hello Peter, are you out at the moment? Should I just text you? Hello, who's that? Came a voice on the other end of the call. Peter blanched a bit as someone came into view. Momo spotted a young woman with blonde hair. Oh, that's your cute classmate isn't it? Your class rep partner. The black-haired girl blushed deeply, and Peter got out of the woman's sight. Seriously you? He sighed, angling it away from the older woman. Should I call back? You're out to dinner with Mount Lady, right? Yeah, celebratory dinner. You on the couch. I recognize that cushion Kirishima used for his nap that time we hosted a study group. Peter said as Momo smiled lightly. It is. Comfy as ever too. Momo saw some flame and laughter in the background. No doubt one of the chefs doing his onion volcano for his patrons. By the way Peter, you said you wanted to try out traditional ramen at some point this weekend. She asked, which day would be fine with you? On Saturday I'm gonna be working on my gear at UA. Gotta reload my web fluid, patch up the suit and make some corrections. Peter replied, gotta look professional when we finally head out there with our licenses right. She nodded, smiling a bit. We have come a long way since classes started several months ago. The American boy chuckled. I actually saw you for the first time on the day of the entrance exams, believe it or not. Peter said with a wry grin. Don't think you noticed me. Momo tilted her head. Really? Oh yeah. I was on my way and um, you walked past towards the recommended student area for the entrance exams while I was grouped with the others that day. He recognized her from back then. Not just from when they were in class together taking part in the practical exam Aizawa set up. Ooh oh I can see a blushy eyeing Mount Lady Oil to the side. Ask her for a date. She whispered, loudly. Can you not? Peter muttered from grit teeth, his cheeks pink. But yeah, I do want to try going out for ramen. But I'll be tied up all day tomorrow. Wanna go for Sunday? Sure, I'll. Oh yes, my guy's getting a date. Peter seemed to have been embraced, him blushing as you was hugging him with one arm. I'm going with friends to you. Tea that is indeed true Mount Lady, Momo replied back, a little flustered. Of course of course, whatever you say. You let go of Peter as the boy looked back at her. I'll keep in touch via text. He gave you a light side eye. Momo nodded, smiling. I'll get in touch and sort things out. I'll see you around Peter. You too yeah Momo. Peter smiled as she hung up and got to texting it. Wait, she called him Peter, not Peter Sam. Momo put that realization to the side, her cheeks warm. Sam, add the sand next time. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 22. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.